Good morning. Welcome to day two of the Municipal Finance Conference. I'm Rich Rifle, a professor of practice here at the Olin Business School and one of the chairs of the conference. On behalf of Brookings, Wash U, Brandeis, and U Chicago, I want to thank all the researchers, discussants, and moderators for their contributions to a great conference. A special thank you to the Brookings staff for their months of effort organizing the conference. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes leading to the conference and indeed over these uh, next two days to make sure this conference goes well and I'm grateful uh, for their contributions. Yesterday we had some really provocative policy topics discussed and today we'll dive into some more mechanical muni market topics. We'll have four papers, researchers presenting papers and then a dis uh, discussant will discuss the research and we'll take questions from the audience. After the four papers are presented, we'll have a panel discussion on Puerto Rico. I'm pleased to see that we have a lot of new presenters this year. We also have several that have been with us since the conference was founded 11 years ago. It's exciting to see how the conference has built over the years. If you'd like to submit a question for our speakers, please use our Slido, sli.do, or Twitter hashtags, MuniFinance, to submit a question. We'll be monitoring those and passing those along to the moderator, researcher, and discussants. Instructions as to how to enter a question were included in the confirming email you should have received this morning. We encourage you to submit uh, as many questions as you'd like. We'll have time to get to several of them after each session. One of the objectives of the conference is to match researchers with practitioners to conduct joint research. So we got a lot of feedback yesterday by email that people found the research was quite interesting and wanted to know how they can engage with the researcher. So if you have a particular interest in a topic that you see presented uh, over the three days of the conference, or just in general, I would encourage you to reach out to one of the conference chairs and we can help make connections for that purpose. So today, moderating our session will be Pepe Finn, CEO of St. Louis-based, woman-owned investment bank, Stern Brothers. Thank you, Pepe, for your contributions to the conference. We're looking forward to the discussions you'll be leading today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rich. Good morning, everyone. The first paper that we will be discussing this morning is entitled Mutual Fund Flows and Capital Supply in Municipal Finance. The researcher and paper giver on this will be Jimmy O. The respondent and discussant will be Peter Block. Jimmy O. is an associate professor of finance at Hang Yang University Business School, who's currently on sabbatical leave visiting the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Prior to joining Hang Yang, Mr. O oh completed military service as an army officer at Korea Military Academy. His main research interests are mutual funds, institutional investors, corporate governance, and ESG. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge. Peter Block, our discussant, is a managing director at Ramirez and Company and the firm's head credit and market strategist. Prior to his time at Ramirez, Mr. Block had a career at Morgan Stanley where he was the head of the trading desk. He was the head trading desk strategist. And prior to that, had a 14 year career at Standard & Poor's. While at Standard & Poor's, Mr. Block invented debt derivative profiles, DDPs, a risk scoring system for municipal interest rate swaps, where he won the highest level corporate achievement award for innovation. So we're pleased to have both of them this morning. And Mr. O, if you would like to go ahead and begin the discussion on your paper. Thank you very much. All right, let me just quickly share uh, the screen. Okay, so I hope every, everyone can see the slides. Um, thank you, Pepe, for the uh, very uh, thorough introduction. Uh, this is joint work with Manuel Adelino, Sophia Jiangjiang, and Jaewon Choi. Right, without further ado, let's begin. So we are all here at the conference because we understand and appreciate the importance of 
municipal financing. That's the backbone of long-term infrastructure investment and day-to-day -day government operation of state and local governments. And the municipal bond market is a big part of that. It's a $4 trillion market. Now, one thing that sets this market apart from other markets is that investor composition is quite different. So if you look at this 2020 breakdown, um, households have a very large share of municipal bond holdings. A half, around a half of all municipal bonds are held by households. And among the institutional investors, what we notice is that compared to corporate bonds where banks and insurance have been traditionally the bigger players, mutual funds hold a large share. And they are important because they have this open-end structure that makes them different from banks and insurance who have a more long-term stable investor base. So how capital supply, in other words, money flowing into these investors affect municipal financing uh, is an important question, yet it has not been addressed, which is an interesting thing because we have a ton of literature on equity and corporate bonds and how flows into mutual funds or insurance companies, etc., affect these financing. Now, another thing that sets municipal financing apart from, say, corporate financing is that it's done mainly through the bond market. Bank lending is there, certainly, but it only accounts for a small fraction of the total lending, less than 10%. So, first of all, the capital supply into mutual funds should A, matter, and B, it should affect the issuer's decisions but the relationship might not be straightforward because of various demand side frictions. Unlike corporate bonds, municipal bonds are subject to various political constraints. So for example, general obligation bonds have to be often approved by the electorate in large. And in some states, you have to have not just 50% approval, but majority, super majority, 60, 67%, etc. And there are also all these decisions regarding new issuance and refinancing and et cetera that we need to look at. So that glaring gap in the literature um, ought to be really addressed. Another thing that sets apart municipal markets from, say, other markets is that though it is supposed to be technically at length, arm's length lending, relationships matter a lot. Municipal bond markets and the bond markets are known for the, in the very high degree of fragmentation along geographical and state along borders and everything. So there the relationship between issuer and the underwriter, as you know, many of you already know, is likely to matter a lot. And mutual funds likely also relate, um, maintain this ongoing relationships with underwriters. Not only they participate in the primary markets through these underwriters, they are also the broker dealers that deal with the secondary market trading. So relationships are likely to matter a lot, ex exacerbating the impact of fund flows and potential issuance decisions of the issuers. One thing that I want to emphasize here is that this channel is likely unique to the mutual fund, municipal bond market rather. Now, in the literature that we know uh, in regarding corporate equities and bonds, it's the price that drives these decisions. Managers see stock prices going up or corporate bond prices doing better. And then that affects their decision to over whether to issue more or less. In municipal bonds, on the other hand, prices are pretty much non-existent. Yields do exist, but most of the bonds trade very sparsely, let's say no more than a few times per year. So that's what distinguishes this mechanism apart from what we see in corporate side of the market. So what do we do? We examine the extent to which money flowing into mutual funds drive municipal bond issuance. Here we examine both the likelihood and the size of issuers. And what we um, talked about earlier regarding relationships, we explore that more deeply to the relationships between issuer and underwriter and underwriter and fund matter in municipal bond finance. Second part of the paper is then dedicated to where do these money end up? In other words, does that finance new projects or does that fund refundings of existing projects? 
what sort of bonds are issued, general obligation, revenue bonds, do voting requirements matter? So we look at the finer details of the municipal bond market. And um, here the challenge really is to find a good exogenous flows into mutual funds. So let's talk briefly into the story we want to rule out. So suppose that fund managers are receiving good inflows, not because the money's coming in, but because they're doing well and they're just skilled managers. And suppose these skilled managers are good at identifying um, issuers that are likely to perform well, you know, not default, not go into all these you know, moratoriums and everything. Then it's not that the money is driving the issuance, but it's just this underlying endogeneity that's causing all these problems. So we want to ensure that the money coming in is coming in for reasons unrelated to underlying fund or issue characteristics. Here, we're going to talk about a mechanical change in Morningstar's overall star rating. Now, Morningstar is a very influential firm, uh, rate funds, and investors use this decision a lot. There's a mechanical change in which the star ratings are calculated at the five-year mark. Um, I'm going to talk about that detail in a minute. And despite the change being this change in methodology being known and mechanical, investor flows appear to respond to this. So we look at that as an exogenous, plausibly exogenous money flowing into investors. Another thing that we do is to compare within issuer at the same point in time. So by doing that, we purge out any demand side issues and then look at funds with better flows or not better, more flows or less flows and how that affects their decision to participate in the primary market. So what do we find? Um, as expected, more money flowing into municipality, uh, the, uh, mutual funds increase the likelihood of issuers issuing new uh, municipal bonds, both the likelihood as well as the size of issuance. Now, this is a, not a correlation, but there is a strong causal link because even when we, you know, identify a setting in which these money flowing in is unrelated to fund manager skills or performance, we still find issuance decisions matter in response to those money flowing in. And what we are finding also is that relationships appear to matter a lot. So funds participate in bond issuance largely from their relationship municipal issuers, the underwriters and the issuers with whom they share the, pre the sort of previous relationship with. And one interesting thing that we are finding is that this temporary money flowing into future funds is being used to finance bonds with lower transactional cost, or shall we say, administrative burden. So rather than funding new bonds, they are being used to primarily to refund existing bonds, and revenue bonds are more common than general obligation bonds, the latter of which require voter approval. And we see this difference particularly prominent among states that require supermajority approval for geo bonds. Revenue bonds that, um, you know, they are not uh, reliant on taxing power, so you don't have to do that. And the more difficult the political constraints and hurdles are, we see issuers switching a lot more towards revenue bonds that are relatively free of this problem. So overall, they seem to take advantage of temporarily favorable capital supply conditions by opting for issuances with less administrative burden. Uh, so the data is pretty standard, um, information from Bloomberg and Mergent, uh, merged with fund level information from CRISP and Morningstar, and our sample period is between 2000 and 2020. So let's talk about the Morningstar ratings. Okay, so this is a very influential metric used by fund investors. And what Morningstar does is to calculate risk-adjusted returns of fund performance. They do that for three, five, and 10-year horizons, assuming the fund is old enough to have return history over that specified horizon. And comparing that performance against their peers, 
they are either awarded, you know, five stars, four stars, three stars, etc. Now, these star ratings are known to be highly influential. But there's a very interesting dynamic happening at the five year mark. Now, until five years, funds don't have long enough history to have a five year rating. So Morningstar calculates the overall rating using only the three year rating. But when the fund turns exactly 60 months old, suddenly it becomes a weighted average of 60% five year and 40% three year ratings. Why does this matter? Because the five year rating seems like new information, but ultimately the new information that comes in is really what happened between three years ago to five years ago. That has been known in the market for what? Already years and years. So it's a stale information. Yet this affects the fund star rating, three stars, four stars, five stars happening at the five year mark. So we horse race those that have been upgraded at the five year mark against those that remain at their previous rating at the five year mark. Our question is A, do fund flows respond to this mechanical change? And B, do issuers respond to that? So what we are finding is there's a strong flow response. Despite the fact that this information was out there in the open and known for years, unlikely to be related to managers' recent performance, which we show in untabulated tables, um, yet investor response seems to be strong. So that's unlikely to be manager skill or recent performance driven thing. And in response, what we are finding is following the upgrades, issuers likelihood of issuance also increased significantly in the first two quarters thereafter. We confirm this in a more formal regression setting called the difference in difference setting as well with controls and everything. So what we are seeing is there's a causal link. This is not just a correlation, but a causal link between money flowing into mutual funds affecting the likelihood of issuances of issues that they hold. Now, in the last three minutes or so that I have, we talk. Let's talk about relationship. So we know municipal bond market is fragmented, and it's the underwriters that will drive these decisions a lot. So we divide the issuers and funds into those with previous relationship in the primary market versus those that without. And this relationship can be defined in many ways, right? Fund and issuer or fund and underwriter, or fund underwriter issuer all sharing same um, relationship. What we are finding is that the main relationship seems to be driven primarily by funds that share and fund underwriters and issuers that share previous relationship in the primary market before. And what we are also noticing is that as you move from column one to column three, the stronger the tight-knit nature of that relationship, so when funds are related to underwriter and underwriters related to issuer, that's where we find the strongest likelihood of issuances happening in result, um, in response to money flowing in. And um, let me just skip this for the sake of time being. And in the last couple of minutes that I have, let's talk about where the money goes into. So when capital supply increases, which bond do municipalities issue? The two obvious questions that come to our mind is, first of all, the decision between GO versus revenue bonds. GO bonds are backed by taxing powers and costlier to issue because of voter approval. And that's particularly different in, uh, difficult in states that require the supermajority approval. On the other hand, revenue bonds are easier and quicker to issue without um, voter approval. Another thing that we want to focus on is new fund financing versus refinance. New financing is mainly for new projects, refinancing bond, replace existing bonds, so they're generally easier to issue with lower transaction costs. What we are finding is that it's really the ones that are easier to issue where this relationship between capital supply and issuance is primarily driven. So it's the revenue bond rather than geo bond. Refunding rather than new filing where all this relationship seems to be coming from. And one last thing, this particularly seemed to be driven strongly 
among supermajority states. The states that require strong hurdle for voter approval, that's where the issuers are opting towards revenue bonds and shunning the general obligation issuers uh, following capital supply. So to conclude, what we find is a strong causal effect of fund flows and bond issuance using a quasi-natural experiment based on Morningstar rating introduction. And what we find in terms of our empirical results is that A, relationships matter a lot, and B, issuers seem to take advantage of this temporarily favorable money in financing bonds that are easier to issue, relatively speaking, in terms of institutional and political constraint. So I stop there and I very much look forward to Peter's discussion. Thank you. Great, Jimmy, thank you very much. Um, and now we'll have the opportunity to hear Peter's discussion. Oh, I was on mute, sorry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Jimmy, that was an excellent presentation. You brought up a lot of excellent points, um, many of which I don't think many practitioners in the industry um, have thought about. And um, they're very revealing, and I think they, they uh, require some further investigation. Um, I'll try to do my best here to, um, to go over some of the salient points that you made. Uh, I have some slides uh, and then we'll have a QA and a uh, and look forward to our discussion. Uh, so if we could turn to the first slide, please. <clears throat> um, so the paper focuses on mutual fund flows, but but I'm also arguing that mutual fund flows are, are but one of the three or four major sources of capital for the municipal market. Mutual fund flows are in fact measurable and they are a good barometer of investor sentiment and demand. And most people do follow the, the ebbs and flows of, of mutual funds uh, as, a, uh, as a litmus test for, for retail investor demand. The other major capital providers include individuals that buy individual bonds and reinvestment of maturing principal and coupon payments by all holders. In aggregate, we can simply call this market cash flow. Uh, I show at the top of the page a few years of historical asset class returns uh, between uh, municipals, tax exempt municipals, taxable municipals, uh, S&P 500, other fixed income asset classes, including treasuries and the global ag. ag. Um, the, uh, the other uh, metric that that people in the municipal market often look at is the relationship between AAA municipal rates and treasury ratios, uh, the 10 year muni treasury ratio. I graphed since 2008, the financial crisis, and you can see that there was a, uh, a big spike in the in the in the ratio uh, during the, uh, the, the Fed's taper tantrum in, in 2013. Um, but those are two key metrics that investors uh, look at quite frequently because they're always re chasing returns, relative returns and value. Um, in, in a moment, we'll, on slide three, we'll talk about um, some other metrics for relative value. But it's difficult to say in every instance whether or not market cash flow is actually a symptom or a cause of market weakness or strength. Usually it's a bit of both, depending upon the macro market environment and specific, um, specific technical factors within the municipal market. One of the technical factors that we look at in the municipal market is reinvestment, particularly as percentage of growth supply. We call that net supply. Uh, we can see that in this chart at the bottom of the page uh, that there's a definite seasonality to reinvestment dollars in the municipal market. Whereas at the beginning of the year, that new issuance and reinvestment are generally in line with each other, while the summer months of June, July, August are typically the highest reinvestment periods, uh, where there's uh, there, there's a huge demand for for issuance of municipals, and 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 uh, that usually leads to strength. We're actually seeing that now in the municipal market. Uh, where in, uh, towards the end of June and July, the municipal market has outperformed treasuries um, because of the reinvestment dollars coming in and the lack of issuance that has occurred due to the, uh, due to the spike in uh, MMD and, and treasuries. 
so turning to the next slide. Um, I graphed mutual fund flows um, since 2008. And you can see that, you know, there's definitely periods of drawdowns. Um, and it seems to happen every so often uh, with, with macro events affecting, you know, the rates and equity markets generally. Occasionally, uh, there are muni-specific events, such as we saw towards the end of 2010, 2011, the whole Meredith Whitney scare that, that created massive amounts of mutual fund outflows. And then, of course, you can see, you know, the, the very latest uh, that has occurred uh, in, in, in this year with mutual fund outflows as a result of the spike in interest rates and high inflation. Previous to that, you can see uh, the onset of the pandemic. We had record outflows as uh, everybody was, was running for the exits at once. Um, but when dealing specifically with mutual fund flows from the underwriter side, we tend to notice the effects on issue or issuance decisions and the relative cost of capital more when there are the acute and massive outflows that I just talked about. Uh, during these extreme periods of volatility, issuers tend to delay or downsize issuance rather than cancel them altogether. This is because many issuers in the, in the governmental sectors in particular will issue bonds regardless of capital flows, mainly due to their program capital needs. Um, in more normalized environments, the typical ebbs and flows in the market, we find that fund flows are on balance, less important to issuers' decisions uh, as to whether or not to issue compared to just the general market stability and the certainty of execution uh, in the market. Um, Turning to the next slide, this is just a graph of relative value in our market as of uh, about two weeks ago when I prepared these slides. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, relative value of muni to treasury ratios is, is, is really only fair right now. We're not super cheap relative to treasuries, but on a spread basis for the different sectors and the ratings within the different sectors, you can see that generally speaking, we're pretty cheap. Uh, high yield has maintained uh, a degree of, of richness, and I think that's just due to the fact that there's not a whole lot of high yield bonds that trade relative to high grades in our market. Um, turning to the next slide, uh, here's, here's a graph of monthly issuance um, that we can see the seasonality uh, here uh, from 2019 through year to date. Uh, we, do, we do see that there are strong relationships between the underwriter and investors that results in best, best execution for the issuers. But I wouldn't say that, any, like I said earlier, I wouldn't say that any issuer's decision to issue bonds or how many bonds to issue is directly affected by any one or more fund inflows. I do see Jimmy's point with respect to how when there's a mechanical change in the Morningstar rating, um, that there are more flows into the fund and then that fund invests more in an issuer's bonds. Um, I personally think that that has more to do with the fact that those funds may already own those issuer's bonds and it's an easier credit decision to make um, to buy more of those issuer's bonds. Um, but if anything, if a new issue is well oversubscribed, it could lead to, you know, particularly on the refunding side, bond issues being upsized. Um, but as we can see from the above chart, issuance is just like reinvestment and that is very seasonal and it generally follows a, a, a pattern uh, from month to month. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, depending on upon market stability and the market, uh, you know, volatility, um, what have you. Um, but I do have to say, yes, uh, the, the point is well taken, Jimmy, that the underwriter fund issuer relationships in the business do matter and can heavily influence the quality of execution of an issuer's transaction. The relationship between the underwriter and the funds, the investors, is also significantly impacted by a couple other factors that I don't think you brought up, which is the amount of secondary market business that the investor account does with that underwriter. Um, you know, that's just uh, tr trading, crossing bonds, buying bonds out of the underwriter's inventory. 
Uh, and then that underwriter providing liquidity for that investor uh, when that investor wants to get uh, get out of a position. There's also the historical amount of allocations of bonds uh, when the lead underwriter has allocated bonds to that investor when that underwriter is the lead left or senior manager uh, on previous transactions. So that heavily influences whether or not a fund is going to do business with that underwriter because they know that you know, over time, they're gonna get better allocations on their new issue. Uh, there's also uh, a big component in our market called new uh, uh, designations. We, we have this unique system that's not really present in the taxable market called net designated. Uh, and net designated means that it's up to the investors to decide who gets credit uh, for certain issues, depending upon the syndicate rules, that can matter dramatically to co-managers and co-senior managers of, of uh, negotiated underwriting business. Um, and so the, the, the relationship between the underwriter and the, and the investor makes all the difference on who gets what allocations, essentially, who gets paid more, who gets paid less on new issue. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around that, and I'm not going to get into that whole ball of wax, but that is a major, major topic in the underwriting industry as it pertains to, uh, to compensation. Uh, in terms of the investor's fund relationship uh, with the issuer, I would say that this is a, a uh, relatively um, less important topic, except with the largest and most frequent issuers, which tend to in, uh, have uh, relationships with the investors themselves. I mean, you'll often have, you know, quarterly conference calls, particularly in the hospital, higher ed sector, sometimes the airport sector, uh, you know, you know, big transit agencies, states, what have you, where there are relationships between investors and issuers. But I think for the most part, just given the, the tens of thousands of, of issuers in our market, the relationship in the, between the investors and the issuers is, is generally non-existent, except, again, for the largest, most sophisticated issuers. Um, the, um, the other point I want to make is that um, the, the point that the paper makes regarding funds experience in, inflows and being a participant on an issuer's bonds be more likely to buy the bonds the 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 um, the bonds offered i would say that this is true but not always simply because an investor already holds an issuer's bonds does not necessarily mean that just because they receive fund inflows that the investor will necessarily necessarily invest in those bonds the decision to invest in new bonds has multiple variables including the current market competing issues on the date of issue, whether or not that investor is full on the name. Many investors have uh, single name uh, limits on, on who they, on, on, the, on the credits that they can buy. And also the investor's current view of the issu issuer's credit quality and the yield at which that issuer's current bonds uh, are issued. Also, uh, of course, impacting is just the general level of municipals relative to treasuries. In some cases, particularly in the short end of the curve, it's more efficient to buy treasuries, uh, depending upon the market versus any issuer's bonds in particular. Um, and then turning to the very last slide, um, you know, the we do a forecast every year as does all major investment banks in, in our industry. Um, we're generally uh, year over year in the middle of the pack. Um, this year, we were calling for four, between 450 and 470 billion of issuance. We're significantly behind that right now. Um, and obviously, because of the, the backup in rates, uh, both in treasuries and municipals, and it has slowed issuance dramatically, particularly on the taxable side. Uh, which for the last couple of years, because of the low absolute level of rates, we saw taxables becoming uh, what seemed to be a permanent feature of our market at about 25%, but that obviously has slowed down dramatically. Um, I'm, I'm in the process of revising this forecast down. Um, but when we talk about issuance in aggregate from year to year, 
you know, the new money component is, is a big variable, obviously, but one of the larger components is just the universe of current refundable bonds and advanced refundable bonds. Uh, and our guess, it's really no more than a guess, uh, as to the percentage of current refundable or, or uh, advanced refundings that will occur in the market. And that really has, has to do with, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the relative value of municipals uh, versus treasuries, the, the absolute level of rates. And also a lot has to do with investor uh, or issuer psychology, rather. Um, you know, the, the, the best example right now is that taxable still makes sense for advanced re refundings, but it's very difficult for many issuers to wrap their heads around the fact that rates have gone up in, in most cases, 100 plus basis points. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons that taxable issuance is, is down so dramatically versus last year. So with that, those are my final comments that my prepared comments, and I'm happy to continue the discussion um, wherever it may lead. All right. So, so Pepe, there's one question on the, from Slido for Jimmy. Uh, is there any sense whether funds with existing underwriter relationships are buying the bonds and holding them for their fund or are they then flipping them into the secondary market? And then I think we have time for Jimmy to respond to all those comments that, that uh, Peter made. Thank you very much. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so regarding your question, so the currently what we are measuring is the primary market participation and primary market issuance. So um, yes, these funds are, <coughs> sorry again, um, buying those uh, relationship issuers bond in the primary market and holding them. Um, we don't have a good way of seeing whether they then dump this onto the secondary market or not. But if there's a granular level of data, then I think that's something that is definitely worth investigating. Thank you. Right, and regarding Peter's excellent discussion, this is exactly what we wanted from um, the conference. You know, you're getting the perspective from those that are in the market. It's great. And um, I also believe, um, I think we had a um, call before with Pepe and and Peter and it doesn't seem like this is going to be a you know first order thing that issuers are just suddenly going to find new investment because funds are suddenly getting money you know they will have their projects planned and they will have their needs but what we are finding is that it's these at the sort of margin when those conditions are temporarily favorable either through refundings or maybe by um, just taking back something that have, they have shelved from a few quarters ago or something, and then quickly doing that, it's plausible. And our, our empirical re um, results are very much pointing towards to this, that they are increasing some of those refunding or older projects uh, coming back type of issuances and also happening at a larger size. And I, I do take Peter's point regarding... Um, a lot, you know, some of these might have to do with funds having better knowledge and better credits regarding this particular issue. And that's one thing that distinguishes bond market from equity market, that mutual funds generally have information advantages in certain issuers compared to others, maybe through a mandate or whatever. And that's also going to be you know, accentuating this relationship a lot. Um, your point regarding the secondary market relationship between broker and mutual funds is well taken. We'll look into that. Also regarding historical allocations as well. And um, all these um, the net designated regarding the syndicates and investors pretty much deciding who gets credit. I don't think we have a good data on that front yet, but um, uh, subject to data availability, I think that's a very promising avenue that we can investigate further as well. But all in all, um, I, I thoroughly appreciate all of your comments and that's a lot of food for thought. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Great. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for your research, your time, your discussion. Um, it was very informative. So thank you both. And we will move into the next session.
Thank you. Pleasure being here. Thank you very much. Next session this morning will cover the cross section of municipal bond returns, which is a paper presented by Sam Wang, who is a vice president at Dimensional Research. The discussant on that paper will be Steve Winterstein. Um, Mr. Wang is a vice president at Dimensional Research. He leads a team focusing on fixed income research, including strategy design and customization, empirical study on bond investing, trading analysis, as well as providing education on systematic strategies. He earned a PhD in mathematics from Purdue, specializing in probability theory and quantitative finance. Steve Winterstein is the head of is the head of capital markets at Alpha Ledger, a developing muni blockchain agency, where he leads the origination of municipal personal debt on the firm's blockchain system. Prior to joining Alpha Ledger, he served as the head of municipal fixed income at Market Access. And before joining Market Access, he was the head of municipal strategy and research at Wilmington Trust Advisors. He has served on the board of a number of, um, he has served on a number of industry boards, including the Municipal Bond Club of New York, the MSRB's Retail Investment Advisory Group, the Technical Advisory Committee of Municipal Bonds of America. So we look forward to an interesting discussion with them. Um, and Sam, if you would like to go ahead and start with the discussion on your paper. Thank you, Pepe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and many thanks to the Brookings Institution for making this happen, and thanks all the staff to helping with us on this topic. So let me share my slides. So today I'm going to present the latest paper on the systematic municipal bond strategy, the cross-section of municipal bond returns. Uh, we have a couple of items we want to cover, uh, but I have 15 minutes to cover the highlights of the paper. So to start, I will introduce the framework to study the expect return of the municipal bonds, and then we'll move on to the key drivers, three key drivers of the higher expect returns for municipal bonds. And in the end, I will cover a, a framework to design a well-diversified low turnover strategy that incorporates all these research into uh, practice. In order to study the cross-section of municipal bond returns, we need to find a way to calculate or estimate the expect return of a bond. For a, a general bond, the returns can be decomposed into three components. First, the yield. Second, the term. And the third is the future change of yield. For example, if you think you buy a five-year bond, hold it for one year, and then sell it as a four-year bond, uh, the first component will be the yield you get when you hold it as bond for one year. And the second component is when you buy the bond uh, at a cheaper price or higher yield and sell it uh, at a higher price with a, uh, with a lower yield, uh, assuming the yield curve is upward sloping. And the last term, the third term, the future change in, in yield, that is random, which is not observable today. Based on many academic research and our internal research, we found that expect return from the third component is usually zero. On average, uh, it's very hard to predict the third component. And uh, today's uh, predictor, best predictor of future yield curve is actually the current yield curve. So with that, we are thinking why we shouldn't incorporate this same framework into municipal bond expect return calculation. However, there are some unique features of municipal bond that requires us uh, additional thinking. 
First thing, municipal bond is highly segmented and it's less liquid. Over a million bond available on the market on a given day and not all of them are traded. The second thing is the transaction cost is pretty high for municipal bonds comparing to treasuries or corporate bonds. About 20 basis point for us to 70 basis point for a round trip, give or take. And the last uh, but not least part are related to capital gain taxes. Many municipal bond investors are tax sensitive, while the coupons of municipal bonds are tax free, but the capital gain from buying and selling municipal bonds are not. So that's why we need to take this long-term investing behavior into consideration when we model the expect return of a municipal bond. Uh, uh, in, in all, we propose a framework that uses yield to estimate expect return for municipal bond, and we have data to support that. Sam, can you make your slides uh, full screen? We're seeing the preview as well as the slide you're showing. Will do. So let me just uh, 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 change it. I think that I can just switch it. Uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's fine. It, it doesn't work right now for my end. So, uh, uh, let me continue the discussion related to the um, uh, to the cross section of uh, um, uh, municipal bond expect returns. So we have a cross sectional data of uh, uh, of the municipal bonds, uh, which covers all the institute uh, in the index constituent of the Bloomberg Barclays uh, municipal bond index. We have the monthly data between October two thousand six and December twenty twenty one, and we run regression. Uh, a cross-sectional regression based on these data. So we found there is a reliable and uh, uh, positive relation between the current year and the field and the future returns. As it's shown here, the coefficients is uh, the coefficient of the main regression is above one and the t-stat is above two. Uh, in addition to that, we also test the robustness uh, of the regression uh, condition on the liquidity of these bonds. Here, we group the bonds into two groups. The first group has, uh, has bonds that are more liquid and the second group has bonds are less liquid. And we have uh, uh, the similar redoubt uh, coefficients above zero and the T-stats are uh, pretty high. So in conclusion, the what we have here is a, a, we found a strong predictive power about current yield on future bond returns. And we certainly want to use that in our strategy design and ongoing research. What we found uh, next is there are three main sources of higher expect return. Uh, the first is related to the issuer, uh, issuing state of these bonds. Uh, in essence, a uh, state with higher state income tax and uh, when they exempt the, uh, exempt the income tax from investing in state munis, these bonds are pretty much in favor by the local residents. We call this a tax clientele effects. For example, uh, the in states of in state of California, local residents have a higher demand for Californian bonds that drives the price high and the yields low. So. Alternatively, for other states that has ha, that have weak or no clientele effects, as we listed here, uh, these states uh, include uh, states with no personal income tax, like like Texas, and uh, in, uh, other states like uh, states that generally tax both in-state and out-of-state uh, municipal bonds. And the last subgroup is states like Utah and Washington, D.C. They don't tax uh, municipal bonds uh, in general. So these states with potentially weak or no clientele effects uh, generally have a higher yield uh, comparing to states with a stronger, on, uh, a stronger, or stronger tax clientele effects. And what does it show in the data? 
So what we do here is we form two portfolios based on these two groups, weak clientele effect states and other states, and we uh, studied the yield difference between these two portfolios. Uh, if, on top, we have the yield evolution over time in our sample, and on the bottom, we have the yield difference between these two uh, group of uh, these two group of states. And we found that almost every month, the yield spread or yield difference between these two groups are positive. That confirms the theoretical uh, or the uh, theoretical uh, idea that there should be a premium between these two group of states because of the uh, different tax treatment or the clientele effects. The second uh, premium or the uh, sources of higher expect return we can find in our data is related to the, to the term spreads and the term premiums. Uh, what we found here is the intermediate term bond or intermediate duration bond outperforms short duration bonds in general, but there is a strong predictive power of current term spread uh, versus, uh, of on the future term premiums. Here we show the bar charts of the average term pre premiums uh, condition on the beginning month's uh, term spreads. Uh, for example, uh, uh, on average, the, the, the term premium is 19 basis points every month, but in months when the term spread is wider, for example, above 50 basis point, we can see the term spread for the next month increases to 23 basis point. And in months when the term spread is above 100 basis point, the on average, the term premium increases to 28 basis point. So there's indeed a reliable and relation, a positive relation between the current term spread and the future term premiums. And we also showed this relation in, uh, in our paper using regression, time series regression. One more thing I want to add in this slide is the, the relation, the positive and reliable relation is robust across different credit qualities. If we uh, group the bonds into triple A or double A rated bonds, or alternatively single A or triple B rated bonds, the pattern is more or less similar. The third high uh, sources of higher expect return relates to the credit spreads and the credit premium. We actually got very similar results in this slide comparing to the previous slide. We found the on average, the credit premium is positive, but in months when the credit spread is wider, the average next month's term premium is uh, bigger. So you can see the increase, increase uh, increasing pattern uh, for all the bonds, for shorter duration bonds, and for intermediate duration bonds. All these can be, all these results can be found in the paper, and we also run a time series regression and got similar uh, positive and reliable relation. With that, now I'd like to introduce you a framework to design a systematic municipal bond strategy that incorporates all these uh, research in, into the portfolio design. So what we are trying to do is systematically overweighting, underweighting certain segment of the municipal bonds so that we can target higher expect return while, uh, while, subject, while being subject to different constraints. Uh, the highlight of the strategy is we want to have a variable approach when we deciding the overweighting uh, in between different states, different credit quality, or different duration buckets. Uh, for example, when the credit spread is wider, we will overweight lower tier bonds like single A, triple B bonds. When the spread is narrow, we might not want to do that. So this is all captured in this uh, constraint or setup in the in the portfolio design. Uh, the last but not the least, I want to mention we also also take the rebalancing and the turnover constraints into consideration in the portfolio design because the transaction cost in municipal bond is pretty high. So in, in practice, we have to incorporate that. But in the simulation, we will have a maximum turnover constraint and do the rebalancing annually. How does the result look like? Uh, here, we listed the three strategies with uh, uh, including the uh, municipal bond market between, between one year and a 15 year maturity, a custom static credit quality strategy and simulated uh, municipal uh, systematic strategy. We can find on average, 
the systematic strategy outperformed the market by about 48 basis point. Of course, that comes with a trade-off. The standard deviation of volatility is higher comparing to the market. And in some of the risk measures, you do see them uh, the underperformance in, uh, in certain periods uh, and the max drawdown is bigger uh, when comparing to the market. Uh, in terms of the characteristics, we can see the yield is higher for our systematic strategy. That means we are actually targeting the higher expect return if we use the yield as a proxy of expect return. And the duration is comparable, but we also overweight the lower tier bonds uh, comparing to the market. Some might say the performance, the outperformance might coming solely from the overweighting the lower credit quality bonds. That's why we introduced we included a second strategy here, uh, which applies a static credit quality weight. Uh, the ever uh, the weight in of each month between the uh, different credit quality is exactly the same as the average credit quality weighting in the systematic strategy. We can see the uh, systematic strategy also outperformed uh, the static credit quality strategy by about thirty basis points. So there is value at when we apply this variable approach in terms of overweighting, underweighting across different states, duration, and the credit quality. Uh, let me summarize very quickly here about the key points we want to uh, take, uh, the key takeaways of the paper. So we found that there is a reliable relation between current price or current yield versus future return. And uh, the sources of higher expect returns can be found in the issuing state due to the tax clientele effects uh, and also within the duration premium or the term premium and the credit premium. And we can design a systematic strategy that targets higher expect return uh, and the subject to different risk preference based on the client request. And with that, the strategy outperforms the market and certainly it adds a lot of value for a long-term investor. Uh, that's what we have for this paper. And thanks you for, uh, thank you for listening to us. And I will get back to you, Pepe and Steve. Great, thank you, Sam. Um, and now we'll turn it over to Steve for his comments and discussion. Thank you, Pepe. Uh, and I apologize. I'm going to uh, I'm going to work from my notes uh, because I want to stay on target and get through this in uh, a short period of time. Uh, first, uh, Sam, I, I really enjoyed working with you on reviewing the paper. Um, thought it was I thought it was a good job. Um, the way that I kind of summarize it is I, I visualize portfolio construction. Uh, methods as a four quadrant grid. On the y axis, we have uh, total return and, um, and buy and hold strategy. And then on the x axis, we have uh, portfolio construction, systematic, and then uh, traditional, uh, I don't want to call it uh, unsystematic, but maybe a manual process or idiosyncratic process. And, and I think Sam really, um, uh, in the end, developed a me methodology for uh, the Southwest Quadrant, that is buy and hold largely because he restricts his turnover in his sub-indices to 0.01%, uh, and, um, and it's systematic in, in its nature. And that means, uh, in, in my way of thinking, it's repeatable, it's scalable, uh, it's transparent, and it's explainable. Um, as a foundation, he postulates, and I'll just restate this very quickly, um, state income taxes, term premium, and credit premium uh, are, are the drivers behind uh, expected returns. And, and I will say, after having had 30 years of, uh, of experience, uh, trial and error, it's very intuitive to me that this works. Uh, and I think Sam takes an historically and traditionally very loose and idiosyncratic approach and suggests a framework uh, with a structure and rigor that is an elegant solution that is, again, repeatable and, and, and scalable. Uh, the goal, I suppose, uh, is to replicate portfolio construction such that uh, portfolios can be executed efficiently and quickly uh, and, uh, and with low uh, friction, uh, transaction costs, if you will, uh, have similar risk return profiles across a mandate, uh, low total return dispersion uh, for any given strategy or mandate, and, um, and I think he could probably articulate that potential, uh, those potential list of objectives 
um, uh, in, in the paper, either at the beginning or in the conclusion of the paper. Um, so um, the analysis, uh, in the analysis, returns uh, tend to converge on the yield to worst uh, if held to maturity. And I think that's, that's an underlying uh, thread in the paper. And to cre increase that yield, you have to focus on low tax states, uh, term spreads, and credit spreads. Um, and um, again, it's, it, it's intuitive in a low turnover portfolio. Here are the things that I would consider, Sam, uh, and, and make some, a few recommendations. Uh, first of all, I, I think uh, using the same index, uh, I'd recommend using the same index for the measurement of returns and constituents and your term structure. So I think in the, in the portfolio, you reference the S&P Intermediate Non-AMT Index, which is a very robust index, but then you measure your uh, periodic returns against the uh, Bloomberg Barclays Municipal Bond Index. I just think it's cleaner to be consistent and use the same uh, rules, if you will, on structuring the index with, um, with the index that you're measuring returns on. You use option-adjusted duration as an approach, uh, and you and I have discussed this, Sam, so I'm not... I'm not, uh, this isn't coming out of, um, out of left field. You use option adjusted duration as approximate measure of price sensitivity, but you use yield to worst for term structure and term premium. And of course, as we know, uh, the market is ripe with, with optionality. Um, so uh, with a portfolio in a range of one to 20 years, um, in, in terms of the bounds of maturity, 96% of the portfolio in your study had a duration of less than 10 years. I recommend using OAS uh, an OAS model, which you uh, presumably have for your spread duration or for your spread analysis, and I think you could be a little clearer by uh, specifying your risk-free curve and the implied volatility that you're using. I think using a unit spread per unit of um, uh, uh, per unit OA duration uh, or OA spread per unit of duration um, is is a great way to define your term premium. Uh, also, we've had this discussion, Sam. Um, sectors matter. For example, typically a double A, a double A hospital will have a materially different yield than, say, a double A, double A state GO with the same rating. Uh, S and P has 22 sectors and subsectors uh, in their indices. I think your results would be more robust if you included uh, sectors as a factor that you're uh, loading on or in your analysis. Um, liquidity. Um, we, you only look at how recently bonds trade as a measure of liquidity, and I think that's oversimplified. High quality, high, uh, highly liquid bonds may not have traded over the past year or so, and they don't fall into the bucket of highly liquid bonds. So you bifurcate the market only considering how recently a bond uh, traded. MSRB did a white paper several years back demonstrating the so-called, and, and I'm not quoting the paper at all, but this is my, my words, kind of the half-life of, half life of new issues that come to market and how they trade very frequently over the first month or so. By the second month, they start to, as we call it, go away into portfolios, buy and hold portfolios, and just disappear. And from that point forward, they transact by uh, appointment only. Uh, to use a euphemism. Um, several years back, BlackRock, uh, Richie Prager, Dan Viner, and Steve Lepley, uh developed a model for liquidity that includes market depth, price resilience, average daily volume, bid-ask spreads, and immediacy. Uh, that is, how quickly can I sell a bond without affecting its price? Uh, translating that in the muni market, I think, is difficult. It's not without its complications, but I think it could be achieved um, if, if you were interested in developing this into a more robust process. It could be achieved through clustering or using uh, neural networks to evaluate those securities. Um, the study that you did took place through 2000, from 2006 through 2021. On the tails of that period, we saw episodes of extreme volatility. Um, so we saw, um, and, and we saw a couple of episodes intermittently. And I think Peter uh, mentioned these in his last um, his last talk. But essentially, we had the credit crisis on one end. We had the pandemic on the other end, and we had two notable episodes in the middle, um, the Meredith Whitney uh, 2010 uh, default uh, announcement, and then, of course, the uh, taper tantrum in 2013. Otherwise, the market has been relatively benign and in a, in a, um, in a steadily declining uh, rate environment. Um, and I wonder how the results uh, would have differed if uh, we were in a steeper yield curve versus a flatter yield curve environment, number one. 
And as I mentioned, periods of volatility matter. So with spread compression, as rates decline, bonds with higher credit premium would naturally tend to outperform. And I, I suspect spread widening has had more of an effect on total return over the past year or so as volatility has spiked. So with a look back, uh, and I'll wrap up by saying, you know, with, with a look back, um, um, over the, uh, say, say since June, 20, uh, June 21, I'd be very interested in seeing how your model worked in predicting uh, returns over the, the, the uh, subsequent year, that is looking from today back one year, when the S&P Intermediate uh, AMT Free uh, Index that you use as your term structure has a one year and year to date return of negative 5.5% roughly and 5.4% uh, respectively. Finally, I, I guess uh, what, I, what I would say is, uh, and this is, this is my experience and how I think this could be more relevant uh, if, if you wanted to make it so, uh, investors with low turnover, buy and hold strategies, they operate on the premise that they hold the bonds to maturity. Uh, and, and I understand that you're readjusting the portfolio, but you have a very uh, finite, a very um, a small uh, threshold for turnover. Uh, and, 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 the, and investors think of it as they rarely sell. Uh, and, and then their return uh, approximately is the rolling average yield over their time horizons. The problem is that I've never seen an investor in my 30 years experience, whether it's retail, retail or institutional, whether an institutional corporate client is classifying held to maturity or not avail or available for sale, FASB 115, they, they, they've actually had to liquidate the portfolio at some point, whether for tax reasons, whether because of market volatility or because of a liquidity event or because of a mere straight change of strategy. That said, uh, and, and so I think, I think uh, we need to think in terms of total return. So you elegantly and concisely describe a method of portfolio construction and you limit the scope of your paper as such. I would be interested in seeing a factor-based performance attribution model based on the same index where you load on effects of the curve, that is to say the yield, the parallel shift, slope, and twist, convexity in the roll, and then non-curve effects or spread duration um, loading on state, sector, couponing, and, and, and the rest of it, uh, de minimis, and so on and so forth. And using that model as a feedback loop for por portfolio construction, I think may be more useful in a volatile uh, market where asset managers uh, are competing on total return in the context of allocating a risk budget. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Steve. Sam, do you have response or comments to Steve's uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Steve. I mean, all these, uh, yeah, all these are very, uh, very, I mean, uh, very helpful comments and suggestions as we had discussed before. Uh, these, um, uh, these points are very helpful and um, many of are from practical um, problems. So uh, we, uh, particularly some of the discussion related to OAD, related to the uh, callability, they, they are very helpful and uh, broaden our views and thoughts uh, on this topic. Uh, one thing I can comment on is related to the attribution. So we do have a, uh, uh, of attribution framework to uh, study the I mean, decomposition of the uh, returns, realized return based on uh, the, the proposed measures or factors we have put together in the paper. So I would say in this particular uh, falling interest rate environment, a lot of the contribution are coming from the uh, falling yields. So that's uh, basically I'm confirming what you had observed. So that's what is true. And also uh, regarding to the, uh, the strategy performance uh, in the first half of this year, uh, we will uh, see an underperformance uh, because of uh, the design, uh, but over the long run, it is still outperforming, uh, but we will, uh, we will see it as a risk measure embedded in this uh, strategy because after all, you are uh, targeting higher expect return and that comes with a trade-off. So, But for long-term uh, investor, I believe the framework and the system can help uh, them achieve uh, their goals. So that's it. Thanks, Fefe. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Sam. David, were there any questions that you saw from the audience? Uh, there's one question here. Uh, where did you get your monthly pricing data from? 
So we use the Bloomberg Barclays um, uh, Municipal Bond Index. Uh, we have the constituent level data uh, for for this index, and uh, one of the reasons we we don't we didn't use S and P data because the S and P data we have has a shorter history, so that's why we switched to the uh, the the Bloomberg data, and the, the results are more or less similar, but uh, uh, the periods will be shorter. Yeah. Okay, that's all I got. So maybe we should, Peppy, maybe we should, we have a break scheduled. We can come back. I'm just checking my schedule here at uh, 12.15. Is that okay with you? Is that right? No, actually we're coming back at 12.30, but before we do that, oh, I'll right. just you're ask right. Steve if he's got any um, any additional comments. No, I, uh, I think, um, I, I think, look, Sam, Sam put together a, a, a very cogent and and helpful uh, process, and I think um, knowing knowing that that structure is very helpful for a portfolio manager who has done it on the fly in the past. And it, it takes uh, this heuristics and puts it in a very practical, repeatable, transparent, and scalable uh, process. And for that, I think uh, I think it was a fantastic paper. I'm going to correct. You're right. Thank You're right, you. Pepe. Of course, 12:30 is when we resume. I apologize. Terrific. I don't see any other questions. If neither of our discussants has any final comments, we will adjourn this session and see you all back at 12:30. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you all.
Okay, Peppy, you can start. All right, thanks, David. Good afternoon and welcome back. Our next paper covers local government debt valuation. The presenter on this paper is Oliver Giesecke. Oliver is a PhD candidate at Columbia University and a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. His recent research focuses on state and local government's finances. Previously, he has worked on the transmission of monetary policy on the cross-section of firms and the textual analysis of reports of the Federal Reserve System. Before joining Columbia University, he was a senior research specialist with the Jules Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. The discussant for this paper will be Richard Cicero. Mr. Cicero is the president of Merit Research Services, an investor's tools company, a municipal bond data and research company, which was started in 1985. Merit's municipal bond credit data and analytical package covers over 10,000 municipal bond borrowers. He is a member and a co-founder of the, and the national board chair of the National Federation of Municipal Analysts. Over the years, he has been a frequent speaker on municipal bond issues and often cited in national news sources and trade publications. So, so with that, we will turn it over to Oliver and let him begin with the discussion of the paper. Uh, thank you, Pepe, for such a nice introduction. Um, so I also want to thank the organizers for putting this paper onto the program, and I'm very happy to present today. The title of the talk will be Local Government Debt Valuation, and this is joint work with Harris Martin and Marcelo Sena. Local governments are an important entity in, in the United States. They account for about 1.6 trillion or 8% of GDP of public expenditures and about 10% of non-farm payroll. Despite its economic importance, we actually know very little about the financial position of those local governments. In 2020, COVID-19 has sort of uh, brought to the fore the immediate financial fragility of some of those local governments. Back then, the federal government stepped in and provided substantial fiscal relief in form of those four stimuli package to local governments, which amounted to a total of about 415 billion US dollars. So in this paper, we want to ask uh, one question. What is the financial situation of local governments? And we are taking two approaches to answer this question. First, we use the financial disclosures from the ACFERS or the Annual Comprehensive Financial Reports for the book values. The disadvantage here is that book values are an accounting measure and they are predominantly backward looking. In our second approach, we try to estimate the market values of local government's equity. And here the advantage is that they are forward looking and thus uh, may provide a stronger signal about the financial situation of local governments. Let me just uh, briefly summarize the two main findings of the paper before I jump um, in, into the main uh, session of the paper. First, we drop some- I'm going to interrupt you for one second and just ask you, can you make the slides larger? Is there a way oh, to Oh, larger. Do um, I think actually they're- May not be. Taking already looks, the full screen. pretty screen. good on my screen, Peppy. Oh, all right. Okay. Then that's my bad. It's not how it's showing up on mine. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. So with that, let me briefly highlight the two main points of the paper. First, uh, we document the financial health of local governments, and we find that in 2018, about 15% of cities in a nationwide sample operate with a negative net position. The negative net position is akin to a book equity, book equity position in the corporate context. If we were to use a negative unrestricted, if we were to use the unrestricted net position, which is another measure, it would be even 61%, so an even larger share. We find that these obligations are predominantly related to legacy commitments, that is pension and other post-employment benefits. In the second part, we then examine the market valuation and find that there's a strong positive correlation between the book and the market valuation of equity. And we find that these market val values 
also suggest that an, a substantial fraction operate with a negative uh, market value of equity. So in terms of the literature, obviously we are contributing to a large literature and, and local finances. In the interest of time, let me uh, skip that. And we are also building on a very mature literature on dynamic asset pricing, which allows us ultimately to price some of the non-traded claims in order to get the market values for those. With that, let me now get into the financial conditions. Before I do that, let me just briefly um, introduce the main data sources. Some of them are quite novel, at least to the academic literature. We are building on the annual comprehensive financial report, which we received from Moody's Investor Service for a nationwide sample. In addition, we manually collect those for which uh, we uh, have uh, entities in the sense of certainty sample, but uh, are not in, in that data set. Second, we are building on the annual survey of state and local government finances, which gives us a long time series for expenditure and receipts claims, um, which we use for the pricing. We also get information on municipal bonds from the municipal bond database and MSRB Emma. In addition, we link the debt securities to these issues by building on disclosures which are required by the Security and Exchange Commission. So with that, let me uh, briefly introduce our sample. We have this nationwide sam sample of local governments and further restrict it to those entities for which we have information in 2007 and 2018 available. So in any temporal uh, comparison, we do not have to worry about composition effects. Our final sample contains 1,803 local governments, which cover a total population of about 107 million in 2010. Obviously, because of the data, because of the nature of the data set, um, this data sample is tilted towards bond issues, and we were initially uh, worried that this may tilt it towards larger municipalities. While that might be true, the median population is only 21,000, which we consider as fairly modest. With that, let me briefly introduce the two main financial indicators. So first, we're using the unrestricted net position as a share of operating revenues. Second, we're using the total liabilities as a share of market values of taxable properties. While none of those, uh, no, while no, no, no measure can perfectly describe the full complexity of municipal finances, we do think um, that these two measures have some merit. With that, let me now come to uh, my first histogram and uh, the first descriptive result. On the x-axis, you have the unrestricted net position as a share of operating revenues. On the y-axis, you have the corresponding density. We find that the distribution in 2007 is, is, is actually fairly symmetrical and centered slightly above zero. If we now overlay the distribution in 2018, we find a market leftward shift of the distribution. Further, we realize that um, the left tail becomes fairly thick. Very concretely, the median of this distribution decreases from about 28% to minus 19%, and the fifth percentile, so the left tail, uh, decreases from minus 25% to about 191%. To make that a little bit more concrete, let's take a look at some of the examples that are sitting in the left tail of the distribution. We have Chicago, Illinois, which received a lot of financial press about their financial situation. We have Hamden, Connecticut, and Dallas, Texas. Let me give you one additional piece of, of evidence where we relate the unrestricted net position over operating revenues to a yield spread. So in this specific case, we use the gilgrist sakharsek spread, which is essentially a duration match spread. We find that indeed um, municipalities or local governance that that operate with a more negative unrestricted net position on average pay higher yield spreads. I do want to point out that um, if we now compare municipalities with a positive unrestricted net, net position with a very negative unrestricted net position, despite this tremendous dispersion, the yield spread 
is actually fairly modest. This is like 0.3%. So that's the point that I will come back to later. So th this was, um, this was um, basically the descriptives on the book position. Now, obviously, book position have a lot of shortcomings. One of them is, for instance, that capital assets are counted at at uh, cost minus depreciation. And so this is really sort of a backward looking measure. Instead of, instead we now want to look at the market valuation which captures the economic value uh, going forward. So it's a forward looking measure. So we for that, we start with a simple balance sheet identity. So simply that equity equals assets minus liabilities. We then uh, decompose the assets in the present value of revenues plus cash. For the liabilities, we have the present value of expenditures plus the present value of pension obligation uh, plus the present value of OPEP plus the present value of debt. This uh, results in equation one, which is the market value of equity. I, I wanna briefly go through some of the uh, individual components and where we get them from. So cash is, uh, you know, simply um, a, a liquid um, mean, and so we take that from the from the balance sheet. The present for the present value of OPEP, the present value of debt, and the present value of pension obligation, we are building on some of the landmark papers in in the literature and and follow that valuation. What is a little bit more difficult is to get the present value of revenues and the present value of expenditures. So for those two components, we really have to do some work. And let me, let me briefly describe how we do this. So for that, we are building on a dynamic asset pricing model. And uh, before I go into a little bit more detail, let me just uh, briefly convey the main concept. So essentially we are, we are postulating a stochastic discount factor and a stochastic discount factor prices all assets in the economy. Then we're using some of the assets for which you observe actually the prices in order to estimate the stochastic discount factor and then use the stochastic discount factor to price the, the revenues and expenditure for which no prices are observable. So using this methodology, we can price the revenues and expenditures consistent with those asset prices that are observable in, in the economy. Very concretely, we are postulating a VER process for the state variables. We also uh, postulate uh, exponential FR and stochastic discount factor following the literature, and then use observable asset prices to obtain the parameter values. To just give you a sense about how well we are doing in terms of the, the fit, um, here I'm showing you the results for nominal yields on, on government bonds for one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. And I think overall we, we do fairly well. We do this also for uh, inflation protected securities as well as the equity market as a whole. Importantly, what I want to point out, we, we are doing pretty well to price a, a representative benchmark yield in, in the municipal bond market. So all of the valuations of, of revenues and expenditures will be consistent with the pricing that is observed um, in, in the money market too. So in the interest of time, let me just briefly uh, skip these two slides and uh, maybe just summarize um, some of the um, important components in, in this chart here. So um, this is the price dividend ratio on revenue. So uh, please don't be thrown off by the term price dividend ratio. It is essentially the present value that you get if you receive one additional dollar in revenues today. And um, there is, uh, interestingly, there's a large dispersion of these price dividend ratio across different local governments. And that comes from the fact that uh, local governments are differentially um, exposed to the risk in the economy. So one of the big drivers that we found is, for instance, the share of revenues that you receive from property taxes. It seems that municipalities that have a large share of property taxes seem to be a bit more resilient to the business cycle and thus uh, they would uh, have higher present values for each dollar in revenues. 
Okay, so once we have these price dividend ratios for revenues and expenditure, we are now able to use our previous formula in order to compute the market value of equity. And so here in my last slide, I want to briefly contrast the market value with the book values that we receive directly from the balance sheet. Here on the, in the left panel, you see the market value of equity on the y-axis and the book value that is the net position on the x-axis. And indeed we find a fairly strong positive relationship be, between, between these two values. It turns out, and maybe that is not a surprise, that the relationship is even tighter if we correlate the market value of equity with the unrestricted net position. And he, as, you, as you see here in the right panel. So let me just briefly summarize. We have um, essentially we find in both, both um, instances, we find a fairly strong positive correlation. Obviously we also find that some of the variation of market values, uh, there's a little bit more dispersion, which comes from the idiosyncratic characteristic of those local governments. But overall, it seems like the market values support the message that we receive from, from the book values. And um, even here in, in these charts, we find that uh, a substantial share of local governments operate with a negative market value position. So just briefly, let me conclude. Um, so we found that uh, we, we saw an overall deterioration of financial conditions. We found that some municipalities operate with a negative book equity position, which may raise some concern. Uh, we, we, we computed then the market valuation and found that those market values broadly uh, support what we found from the book valuations. Lastly, I want to uh, raise like one point that I alluded to earlier. We found like relatively little dispersion in, in the credit spread, despite like large differences in the financial position of local governments. And so we, this seems to suggest that there might be some implicit insurance by the federal and, and the state governments. And in fact, this is, this is something that we want to explore in, in, in the more detail in uh, future iterations of this paper. I stop here. Great, thank you, Oliver. Richard, your comments? All right, can you hear me there? Yes, there we go. Now, uh, may I ask, uh, will I be posting my own slides or will that be done for me here? You will be the master of ceremonies okay. on your own right. slides. Go. <laughs> I hope I can do that technically right. Uh, first of all, let me just say, I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to do this. Uh, I, you know, I've welcomed the Municipal Finance Center's annual meeting is an opportunity for us to get the best wisdom we can from the academic community. And I, every year it, it seems to impress me. Uh, the paper here that we just heard Oliver uh, talk about here has been one of those that uh, has impressed me on a very important issue. When I was originally asked to discuss it, <clears throat> I was attracted to doing saying yes to this one uh, right away because it deals not only with the important issue is do prices match up with fundamentals, but it also focused it on two of the metrics that I've been trying to get more and more people to use for a long time. We introduced them in our database when they came out when GASB 34 provided the elements to allow them to, to come out. Uh, we'll talk about those elements, but uh, you know the reaction in the market and, and getting them to be uh, primary metrics has been slow, uh, one a little faster. So we're gonna talk about that. I think that's good. I wanna, these are the four things. Let me put up my slides here. We'll see if we can keep this rolling <clears throat> and, and keep mine within a 10 minute period. That's a challenge, but I wanna do try to do that. So let me see if I can do this right. We'll bring up slides if I'm lucky. Uh, can you see this? Uh, I've got to do the, the uh, share the screen. That's right. All right, we'll snooze that and we'll look for those slides. Here we go. And put them on the slide view.
All right. Is that Perfect. possible, C? Yep. Thank you. Chance. Thanks very much. Uh, technical assistance always helps me, so thank you. All right. In this first one, I'm just going to go over the points, the themes that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Oliver's talked about so much, uh, and some of it I need a course in uh, statistical, a babble course in statistical uh, training in order to keep up with Oliver's thoughts there. But it's more important about what his findings are from my perspective in the context of which he's making them and his team's making them. So the five areas that I want to talk about, first of all, is the large segments of municipalities which operate with negative net position. He calls that uh, equity. Uh, municipal people don't, don't usually use the equity term very often in our lingo. It's a corporate term, and I understand where it's coming from. Uh, but the net position is a similar thing for net worth in our industry. But uh, <clears throat> we have that problem based on the new elements we have since GASB 34. Number two, the financial condition of municipalities is in decline. I picked that up in the study, and there was some reason that, that was uh, made to say that, but let's talk about that. Then the recognized, this is all recognized by the market in form of higher spreads, and then accounting book versus market valuations are highly, highly correlated. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is an important one, and one of the attractions I have is that the net negative equity position, also net position, which is I'm gonna to try to call more often in this talk, reflects the presence of equity insurance and that's by state and local governments. Those are important areas. They come up in our market in different language, but they are, are there, and let's talk about them. The first slide I have here is that what I'm also trying to do, uh, Oliver, and, and to others on the call here, I, I, I like what I see so much that I want to also validate it in any way that I can. And since our database does cover um, uh, to over 10,000 municipal credits in 1,600 cities uh, in 2020, uh, the 2021s are still coming in. I'm focusing here on the fiscal year 2020 net unrestricted position. It used to be called net unrestricted assets before GASB, GASB changed the words. And comparing it to expenses and revenues. And the reason why I wanted to do both is because the study itself uses a different uh, denominator. It uses operating revenues, which is not off the accrual based uh, GASB 34 of statement uh, in a wide statement. It, I believe it's Moody's and I believe they're using operating funds based on old fund accounting, which is not accrual. But if you look at it here and, and we're using expenses rather than revenues, it really shows that it doesn't make any difference whether you do that or not. So I'm gonna stick in, in uh, with the idea of expenses in my comments. But what you're showing, and I, I went a little beyond Oliver what you did here, the, the, the bar charts in the middle of the cities. And you can see that negative unrestricted position is very strong for cities, negative 30%. And uh, uh, you find the same thing for states is negative 19 and, and for counties, not as much 10. And this is unrestricted. And I think that uh, Oliver covered it, but it's really important to look at the unrestricted rather than the net position. I know the state of Illinois uh, auditor likes to use the net position. He should be using the unrestricted position. And the reason why, because it's a better number if you're trying to get a better look at also the uh, shorter term liquidity issue, because you're taking the infrastructure assets off off the pic out of the picture by using unrestricted. Because we most most of us believe they're not easy to sell. They're being sold today from time to time, but that's not the point of a city is to sell its assets. In some cases, they can't sell it anyway. But in here, we surely validate that we have a negative position when uses bottom line ratio, which I think is very much underestimated, understated in our market. Most analysts still, or many analysts still, still use, and the rating agencies were slow to adopt this. Uh, they were using fund accounting and fund balance to revenues, fund balance to expenses. And by doing so, what they're missing that this has is the, the rich information about liabilities in total. And that is the uh, pension and OPEB, as well as uh, debt that's not covered by infrastructure. So with that, that gives you an idea. However, I wanna say again, validation here, in the study that Oliver did on uh, this group, they said 61% had a negative unrestricted 
net uh, position. We have 65 in our in our study, which may be a little bit bigger. Every one of them, there's no census data in here, uh, but it's a number that's very close, and I would call it immaterial. We would agree. Now, the, the net position, which is also referenced in their study, if you were to look at it from the standpoint of all your assets and putting them in, would you still be positive? Actually, you're surprised that not everybody is. Most are. 80% in our study, 82% of the uh, cities would have a positive number on net position if you added their infrastructure assets back in. Interestingly enough, some do not. And it's usually your more uh, distressed cases. So, uh, and that, what can be that be due to? It's not just pensions and OPEB. Sometimes it's also due to the fact that they've mismatched their debt to capital uh, uh, estimated useful life. So they may have debt outstanding that's not being uh, excluded, uh, not only because of operating needs, but more so because of that mismatch in debt service. And the next slide, is the financial condition of municipalities is declining. Here, we went back into 2008, and we see clearly that it has declined when you look at this number. And I did use counties and states too, but the city is the most important one since that's what our study today is about. And it is showing that it's definitely a big negative for since 2014. Now, that said, uh, <clears throat> You know, I, I, I wish, uh, Oliver, I had mentioned this specifically in our, in our meeting we had earlier, but I think the study should have had in it that it should at least recognize the fact that GASB changed the rules twice since they adopted this methodology, and, they, and it made a huge difference on the numbers. Uh, you used 2007 and 2018. In this one here, by looking back here, you can see when they put the full brunt, they had a large portion of it in beforehand. But when they put the full weight of their pension liability into the equation in 2015, there's a very sharp drop. It also drops again in 2018 when the full weight of OPEP came in. Now you see, and this is not on the study, but it's interesting, and maybe we can come back if others are interested in it. States actually have gone up some in uh, recently, and that's due to uh, prior, you know, we're talking about um, uh, some changes and improvements in not only funding for the pensions, that's a small part of the potato, but they actually improved their overall bottom line significantly at the state level just prior to the COVID. And it wasn't hurt when COVID came in. In fact, it, in, in, you can see in here, it accelerated with the uh, uh, thrust of all the, those new uh, funding that came in from the federal government, which actually reinforces the point that Oliver makes and others in the study make here that there's a considerable amount of federal transfers that can come into our industry. And now the third uh, slide here is that the study says most of the decline is associated with legacy assets or obligations. I know I'm getting, I wanna watch my time here. So if I start going too fast, my words, I'll lose all of you. So if you don't mind, I'll slow it down and try to finish up. These are these few slides here are my most important. Legacy obligations certainly are the big picture. Again, it can be some cases they don't match up debt service. That adds to it. Uh, but you can see when you look at this particular slide here that um, uh, the weaker credits, the triple Bs, and even cities over 500,000 actually have the most serious, uh, I think, negative uh, picture on this chart. Now the blue line is all cities, which is even a small potato city. Um, not to diminish it, I love those cities, but they don't have the weight of our problems that we're talking about here. And when you look at this, a lot of them are suburbs. The reason why it doesn't move sharply upward to show that decline is because of the fact that full values tied to a tremendous boom in real estate that we have had actually helped when you're comparing this particular liability weight against the full market value, you you uh, you actually uh, provided a benefit so that this was not an overburden on the particular communities. Now the 2021 numbers are still coming in, but you can see where they are with this amount of the results that are in so far. Um, okay, the next slide here. Now this is probably one of the most interesting ones because 
this is what we do. This is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the market and things that are traditional is what may be uh, impacting spreads. Uh, I think that the paper we talked just talked about here has some very impressive data on spread relationships and linking them to the fundamentals. I hope this will add a little interesting insight as well. But what you see here is that the blue line is the local geo uh, AAA yield index. And you can see it, it's still in historically low territory. It jumps up a little bit there in 2018. Uh, before coming down during the COVID period of time. But we're still at historical levels that are low since World War II. And when you look at the spread relationship, you have two, two bumps upward, pretty significant in 2014. And that's in, you know, uh, Puerto Rico is in that picture in, in, that, in that period of time. Detroit, soon after, there was a number of bankruptcies by our standards, relatively speaking, and defaults that were impacting concerns about GOs. Prior to that period, it really reinforces this whole idea was there's this implied backing by somebody, and we'll, we can talk about that, that it, it, it usually didn't uh, uh, affect concerns or spreads in the GOs as much for a long time. But when we got shocked by Puerto Rico and Detroit and San Bernardino and Jefferson County, Alabama, and to go on a few others in California and, and places close at that period of time, you can see it bumped up to spreads. Not huge, but they are there and they're very noticeable. And then they but bumped up again for COVID. Excuse me, we are closing in on time. Well, so we're, I want well, you know to let These you get the to the important part. I'm, I'm going to be able, because a lot of them could be covered very easily by what, what Oliver's already said. So let me just say, you can see this idea that spreads widen is an inconsistent sometimes in the way we play it out. May I just say, because I think you'll find this interesting, is that just taking, I did look a lot at individual situations last week in the market, New York City, Corpus Christi, and Houston. And I found that using a 4% coupon price to yield or price to the call in 2029, 20, similar duration, all double A somewhere in the double A scale, uh, New York City has a negative 200% unrestricted net assets ratio, Houston 239, and Corpus Christi positive 2.8. What you found is New York City had 177 basis point spread, which would go along with what the study that you heard about said, that there is some widening versus other credits. Uh, and Houston, which has a bigger unrestricted net position, actually has a narrower spread of 146. And Corpus Christi, which has a positive, is still 132, which isn't much different than Houston. So you can see that we have other issues that are going on. Sometimes it's supply demand, it's double tax exempt exemption, although the cases I gave you are not reinforcing that. But I can tell you that it exists. The rating recalibration that was based upon default rate actually causes a problem to this whole idea of spreads, state protection, security provisions, all the same. This one here, correlating mark with book, I'm going to just skip this because I think Oliver covered this so well. I would like to talk about it if it's of interest to others. And then finally, the last slide here, this whole idea is that our prices reflect the implication that insurance by state and local governments uh, is uh, a reason to keep the prices low, even when they have, and they do have, there are cases I said that they do have cases in which their spread is not showing up, which is my problem. I think the market should do that more than it does. And it has to do with this historical view that somebody's gonna bail you out. And Barney Frank even said that in the early part of the two, in the hearings when they needed liquidity in the muni market and they were asking Congress's help, Barney Frank being the House Ways and Means said, don't all munis get bailed out. So you can see that thought process was even in Congress. This concept doesn't hold true for all municipals or we wouldn't have talked about the default and the bankruptcies we have, but this built-in legal, political and economic system for municipals does provide some supportive system. Uh, you, if you overlook uh, those factors, then you're underestimating munis. But on the other hand, the last thing I wanted to say and the very last thing, uh, Pepe, I wanna say, is that if we all bought into the idea, or let's say if we all price bonds only as if we're all gonna get bailed out, it is extremely risky proposition. I don't think Oliver that you're saying that, 
However, I think that is in the backdrop of a lot of investors in muni markets from time to time, and that really shouldn't be there. The leverage trends we're seeing right now are unprecedented, unprecedented and hazardous, and if they're dismissed, we're going to run ourselves into some trouble. So oh, yeah. I know I went a little long there. I ask for your, I apologize to you. I ask for your, beg for your forgiveness here for me, from me, and uh, and I hope we can have some time here for Q and A. Unfortunately, um, oh. we're pretty much tapped out. I'm going to ask Oliver if he's got any concluding comments. Yeah, so maybe I, I just want to briefly respond um, to one of Richard's point. It was point two about the secular decline. Um, we have a very similar picture like you did actually also in the paper and we come essentially to the same conclusion that there were like sort of two big discontinuities that is like from 2014 to 20, um, 2015 and 17 to 18 because of the uh, additional disclosure requirements. Um, while while we think that 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 is certainly obviously affecting our measure, we would also like to make bring it to your attention that you know at this point the municipal bond market was not aware about those um, latent uh, liabilities before that, and so when when these rating disclosures um, or when these financial disclosures uh, came into effect. The market was somewhat surprised and and then basically started to adjust. Um, so yes, uh, can we say that in principle it declined? No, maybe not. But maybe there was sort of a latent component to it the, that that ultimately led to the decline. If you were to just focus on two points in time, fair fair point. Terrific, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time and your comments. We appreciate that. And we will move on to the final paper for this segment, which is taxable advance refundings, um, a critical examination. The paper presenter for this topic is Andy Calateg. Um, he is an expert on the quantitative analysis of municipal bonds, including risk management, tax management, and debt management. He founded Andrew Calate Associates in 1990 and sold it to Intercontinental Exchange in 2021. Prior to that, he was with Solomon Brothers. Um, and prior to Wall Street, he was at Bell Labs and AT&T. On the academic side, he created the first graduate financial engineering program in the country at Polytech University, which is now part of NYU. Um, previously, he has taught at Wharton, Columbia, and Fordham, and holds um, a PhD from the University of Toronto um, in mathematics. He was inducted into the Fixed Income Analyst Society's Hall of Fame in 1997. The discussion on this paper will be Wynn Smith. Wynn is an AI engineer at Wells Fargo. He was previously an independent consultant, a CFO, an investment banker, a municipal advisor, and a quant, a man who's worn many hats. Um, as a quant, he developed innovative tools to optimize advanced refundings, and when he shared his research on government debt markets in the financial press. Um, so with that, I would invite Andy to begin the presentation on his paper. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Happy. Uh, Rich Rifle, in his opening comments, mentioned that uh, we have many newcomers and also many old timers. And uh, I am one of the old timers. I actually attended the uh, first meeting in Boston. I have always enjoyed these meetings. Uh, and uh, it's nice to see the old timers. Uh, it's a pity that we cannot meet in person, but perhaps next year. Now, the uh, presentation, hang on. You, you cannot see this, can you? I would like to, I need some help here to share the screen. Hang on. 
Sure. How Anne, can you Here we go. Do you have okay. any slides? All right, I'll try it again. No, we got it. We got it, Andy. Hold on. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. I want to share them, so you'll have to tell her when to move to the next slide. Right. How is this? Can you see this? Yes. Or all, all right. So. Oh no, well, wait, wait. We're we're seeing how when slides, how when screen, your slides, not your screen. So you, we can use this, but you have to tell her when to advance. So you, what should I be doing, uh, David? Just tell, we see your slides, but they're on our screen at Brookings. So you have to tell how when, when you want her to go to the next slide. Okay. Oh, okay, she's going to run it. All right. Yes. Okay. So um, this uh, presentation, is about uh, taxable advance uh, refundings. And uh, this particular transaction was introduced around uh, 2019. It was very popular in uh, 20 and uh, 21. I wasn't too sure what was happening this year, but uh, uh, Peter Block in his uh, presentation uh, indicated that uh, there's more taxable advance refunding. I, on his, one of his slides, Peter showed uh, 67 billion expected this year. So Peter, thank you for that information. The um, paper I, I'm going to present, I wrote it back in uh, 2000 and uh, at the beginning of 2020, uh, it was published in the Journal of Fixed Income, I'm sorry, in the Municipal Finance Journal last year. And I estimate that uh, as of the end of last year, about $200 billion of, of uh, uh, tax exempt bonds were advanced refunded these taxable bonds. So uh, can you go to the next slide? Okay, thanks. Uh, but I've, here's the outline of my presentation. I will quickly tell everybody what advanced refunding is about in case you're not familiar with it. Then instead of that hypothetical case in my paper, I will look at it and show you an actual refunding that I found on the web. And uh, I'll talk about the timing decision. When should you refund? The question is, are these refundings prudent or are they premature? So. Uh, the question is the timing, and uh, I'll say something about that, and then I make some suggestions towards the end about how to reduce um, the uh, cost of borrowing by perhaps structuring bonds somewhat differently than what the way they are structured today. Uh, so let's um, go to the next slide, and uh, again. For those of you who don't know what advanced refunding is, there is an outstanding bond. It's a tax exempt bond. It's not yet callable. It has a high coupon, basically a 5% coupon. That's the standard today. And the municipality issues a refunding bond while this old bond is still outstanding. Now, until 2017, they could issue tax exempt bonds, but they can no longer do this. So what has been happening is they've been issuing uh, taxable bonds and they have also been exploring other alternatives to advance refund these not yet callable high coupon bonds. The proceeds of this new issue are invested in a so-called treasury escrow. And uh, here's a technical term. They defeat the outstanding bond to the call date. They match the cash flows of the outstanding bond to the call date. Then when the call date comes, the old bond is retired and the old bond and the new bond remains outstanding. And an important part of this exercise is savings. Municipalities always report how much they saved by advance refunding. And in the next slide, if you could go to it, I will show you this. Now, um, this slide has indicated at the bottom uh, I found this on the this example on the web, the Massachusetts School Building Authority, and it's very similar to the example that I have in my paper. 
So uh, if you look at the paper and you look compare it with the transaction okay, here, you see a lot of similarity. So let's look at this transaction. The uh, authority in 2019 issued $750 million, million dollars of taxable bonds to refund outstanding tax exempt bonds. The tick, which is like the yield to maturity of the new issue, was about 3.24%. And if you assume the outstanding bonds had 5% coupons, that looks pretty good. It's 175 basis points below the coupon of the old bonds. Then these proceeds were used to refund these bonds, which were issued in 2011. Now, though they, were, they are not yet callable. They would be callable in 2021. So there's two years between the uh, taxable issuance and the uh, call date. Now, here's the amazing uh, fact here. This is out of this document at the bottom of the page. They saved 135 million dollars, amazing uh, accuracy to the nearest dollar here, which is 18% of the refunded principal, 18%. We talk about 3% to 5% saving, this is the 18%, phenomenal. They saved $192.5 million in undiscounted flows. This is all on the document. They also mentioned that on this escrow account during in this two year period, they, own, they earned $444,000. And uh, that's not very impressive. And it makes you suspect if uh, you have, if you, if you earn four, $444,000 on a $715, $715 million investment, it makes you wonder, is this a good deal? The book run, running manager was the away and the advisor on this enormous deal was EFM. Now, what you don't see in this press release is the cost of issuance. There's, of course, there's this, always some issuance cost. Let's see, it's four million. But much more importantly, what's missing from here is the value of the forfeited option. The I'll talk about this later. But once you advance refund, you cannot refund again. And I estimated that the value of this option was 180 million. They saved 135 million. So what happened to the rest? They wasted $45 million that you don't see. And that's the topic I would really like to focus on today. Uh, let's go uh, to the next slide if we could and talk about high coupon um, just about these 5% bonds callable in year 10. What happens to them? So let's begin with something that we never hear about. When you issue these bonds, you pay for the call option. The question is, what if this 5% bond happened to be a non-call live bond? So I just assume here that you could sell it for 145 instead of 120. So there is a cost of the option, which is 25 points up front. And when we talk about how much we save 18% or 20% or 25%, we should be thinking about in relative to what we paid for the option. And we should pay, we should expect to save more than 25 points just to make it a good deal. And we and uh, you know the municipal issuers and uh, advisors still talk about 3% savings and 5% savings, which is just completely inappropriate when you're, you're, in, you're, you're in a different uh, area when you issue 5% bonds. So when you advance refund, cash flows are locked in, 18% in the case of the uh, authority. But as I mentioned before, you give up the option to uh, refund later. And again, I estimate the option value is 24%. So the net loss is 6% per 100 million principal. Quite, quite substantial. I mentioned $45 million loss estimated. Uh, 
in the case of the transaction before. Uh, here's an interesting question that you may want to think about. So if there's this loss of option value, who, who benefited from the waste? I have posed this before, and uh, I know it's not as easy as you might think. So think about it. Who get benefits from, from early premature refundings? Now, I mentioned one notion that I'll come back to later on, which is refunding efficiency that I have been advocating for many years. But the issuers should be looking at is how much they save normalized by divided by what they give up in optionality in the typical taxable advance refunding, the um, ratio is about 75%. Seven, uh, in the paper, I mentioned 70%. So this is way too low and we should be aiming for 95 or 100%. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, if we could. And uh, the next two slides are from the paper. And the first, this one is actually just a break even analysis. So let's look at it so we understand what's going on. In this case, the, uh, we refunded a 5% bond with taxable bonds whose rate was 3.05%, somewhat lower than the mass uh, school example, and uh, saved $24 million. However, this is two years prior to the call date. And at this time, the tax exempt rates were 2.5% as indicated at, uh, towards the bottom. So the tax exempt rates were 55 basis points lower than the taxable rate. That's kind of a conservative estimate. And the question is, what if you waited until the bonds became callable and then you use tax exempt bonds? Where would tax exempt rates have to be two years from now in order to save $24 million NPV. Well, the break even, as you can see on the right side, would be at quite a bit higher. Rates could move up from uh, 250 to about 330. That's an 80 basis point spread just to break even. In other words, unless rates move up at least 80 basis points, it would have been preferable not to advance refund. Standard rate even analysis. And keep in mind, rates could also go lower. Who knows where rates are going to go? But the point is, at the time you make a decision, the implication is that, we ex that you expect rates to go substantially higher. And by the way, that seems to be pretty standard assumption when you talk to municipal treasurers. Rates are always expected to go, go higher. OK, the next exhibit is more technical. It shows the refunding efficiency now what's refunding efficiency it's the ratio of the savings by the option value how much you get versus what you give up and ideally you would like to get the whole value 100 percent well in this case in order to get close to 100 percent you would have had to refund at 2.6 percent but we refunded at 3.05 percent and we got only about 70 percent of the option value, which is, as I keep on saying, is just unacceptably low, at least in my opinion. So remember this refunding efficiency, look at savings divided by option value. We'll talk, we can talk later about how you calculate option value, but at the very least, let's recognize that there is an option which needs to be taken into consideration when you pull the trigger. And you've ahead. got a couple more, a couple more minutes just so we're sure that wynn has got okay. time to jump. That's in. fine. Let's go to the next one. I have two more exhibits, and I think they are important. So how to how to improve the refunding decision? One, as I keep on saying, consider forfeited option value and this refunding efficiency. Don't use three percent and five percent threshold. There's absolutely no justification for it. Um, they are not suitable for 5% bonds. They were okay for bonds when we, they were issued at par. You should utilize uh, industrial strength 
analytics. Uh, uh, Steve Winterstein referred to the difference between um, yield curves and interest rates. Uh, people often miss that very not, not so subtle point and so on. Now, one important point, the, uh, and I do want to mention this, where do you get help if you're a municipal issuer? If you look at the GFOE's best practices, it mentions, I did it yesterday, it mentions savings 39 times, it mentions option value once, and it says, oh, if you need help, go to the MSRB. But the MSRB certification of municipal advisors, is it, it, they don't teach, you don't have to know anything about option value. So how are you supposed to be making the right decision if you don't have proper, proper help? I, I'll let you think about this. Now, my next exhibit, if you could go to it, it's a general point about board, how to, what municipalities should do and what should not do. This 5% non call temp bonds increase the call prices. Don't, let the, don't allow calls at par because everything is refunded. And I mentioned a task here. Can you find any 5% bonds older than 10 years? And if not, why do we call these bonds 30 year bonds when they are always refunded after 10 years? You have huge savings, you have huge transaction costs, but these are intermediate bonds, not long term bonds. At the bottom, I mentioned a couple of possibilities that you probably haven't heard of. One is ratchet bonds, which automatically refinance themselves, uh, no, no transaction cost. And you wonder why haven't you heard about it? TVA wonders this. They issued over a billion of these. Automatic the long term bonds automatically refinance themselves at no cost. The coupon always declines, it never decreases. And issue optionalized bonds. It turns out that option, optionalized bonds have a lower expected cost than callable bonds. And it has to do with the fact that municipalities should be discounting their cash flows at their taxable rates and not at their tax, tax exempt rates. I just wrote a paper about this. I don't want to elaborate. Let's go to the very last exhibit because I, I have some, if you can show the uh, references. There's a lot of literature and using uh, just the literature and common sense, I think people could make much better decisions. The only thing I, I'd like to highlight is this optimum bond calling and refunding that I wrote back in my Bell Labs days, co-authored it. It was in 1979, it was used very wide why did this the, the Bell system? Billions and billions were refunded using the uh, uh, call efficiency concepts. And unfortunately, very few people are familiar with this in the tax exempt world. Uh, one more thing I want to see the very last reference, which has to do with what do you do about these 5% callable bonds? And as Rubin Smith suggested in his bond buyer article in 2016, increase the call prices so that you refund them only if rates actually decline. Don't refund them. You should sleep when rates are 3%, rates go up to 4%. They are refunded and everybody's cheering about the savings. No, if you increase the call prices, this will not happen. So I'll stop here and let uh, Win take over. I was gonna say, I'm gonna give Win a chance to, to jump in. Okay, thanks very much, Bobby. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right, hi. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to comment on Andy's, Andy's presentation. Andy's worked on these issues longer and harder than anyone, and he makes really important points. Before I begin, I'd like to stress that the views I uh, express are my own, not necessarily those of Wells Fargo. At Wells Fargo, I apply artificial intelligence techniques to helping manage risk. But before this, I spent many years solving financial problems or helping solve financial problems for governments and businesses. I still have a keen interest in municipal finance. Uh, I took it personally when Congress abolished tax exempt advance refundings. My inbox blew up yesterday when some market participants saw I was going to discuss Andy's paper. I heard some reasonable points and I'm going to reflect on, on some of those uh, in my comments today. I, I want to comment on really two big questions that are raised for me by Andy's, Andy's presentation. But first, I want, I want you to picture two characters, a treasure hunter 
and a farmer. A treasure hunter and his well-paid team want to dig up buried treasure as quickly as possible before somebody else gets it. The treasure hunter thrives on speed and execution. It is tactical. The farmer, the farmer knows the value of her crops and, and wait, expects to wait until the crops reach their peak in value. She understands the risk in waiting, but she has a plan that can be adjusted as conditions change. The farmer is patient and strategic. With those two characters in mind, let's move on to the big questions. First big question is, should issuers use callable premium bonds when they finance new projects? We'll think about the cons and pros. We'll take them in that order. The cons would ally with Andy's uh, thinking on this, uh, I think, and, and a lot of what my thinking has been. One of the cons for me with callable premium bonds, these 5% par call bonds, is they don't really provide long-term committed funding for the bond issuer at a market rate, like say a par bond would. Instead, they provide really what's a worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is that for some reason they cannot actually refund them and they're stuck with a 5% coupon and they incur really a, a high yield to do that. Another con of the callable premium bonds is the issuer is likely to have to refund. And so they're gonna likely to pay, they're likely to pay transaction costs more than once, as Andy was pointing out. And they're likely to have, have to do an expensive taxable refunding, or at least they're quite likely to do that. Uh, another issue with the callable premium bonds is they really create this new asset for the issuer. And let's, let's say that it's, it's a small school district, but now on their balance sheet, there's this really cryptic option. What is, what is this thing and what is it worth? Is it really appropriate for uh, say a small, small bond issuer to, to even have to think about how they manage an option? Also, as, as, as Andy really alludes to, the callable premium bonds muddy the waters of, of words like savings and, and maturity. You know, what is savings when, when you refund a bond that they really kind of had savings at the, at the moment it was, it was issued? What, what, what does savings mean anymore? And also, what, what does maturity mean? Is a 20-year bond really a 20-year bond if, if it's really likely uh, to go away in 10 years? And, and Andy's touched on, on those points. Another thing about callable premium bonds is if the issuer doesn't call the bond, they're going to really end up paying a high coupon that they were never compensated for. It's kind of like unpaid overtime. And if you think about the, the true interest cost, uh, that, that's based on the debt to maturity relative to the bond price. And, and that, that's really going to get bumped up by, by the callable premium bonds. And, and I think that that can be a sign of, of trouble. But what, what are the pros? Uh, they certainly may achieve the best yield to the call date or the, or the best pricing yield. It does need to be understood that that's the best yield to the call date is not the best yield to maturity. They can create at least a worst case test service schedule for the issuer and that the issuer can likely improve on. And maybe this isn't the worst thing in the world because if, if the issuer sets, sets up a worst case debt service schedule, and they plan around that and they budget around that, that creates perhaps some conservatism uh, and, and that could be a good thing. Most importantly, I think in the, in the market and what the options are available to the issuer, sometimes callable premium bonds may be the most realistic option available or at least for, for part of the bond issue. There is a lot of demand for the high coupon bonds and for callable premium bonds. Uh, there are investors who really prefer the limited risk with a shorter duration uh, and, and less exposure to rising rates. Uh, they, they do like that potential for upside if the bond isn't, isn't called. Of course, they all have been as far as we know. And uh, Andy and I have both recommended the par call, but um, that, that may make the bond less attractive because it becomes less, less generic. So th that has to be considered. I, I'd be open to uh, trying to at least starting to increase the call prices and, and see what happens. But it just may not be the long-term committed funding 
in the sense of, of, of par bonds isn't really available from investors. A couple of years ago, I worked on a hospital issue and we were really limited on the, the average life of the deal that the investors would accept. And we had to structure it so that we could, we could beat, that, beat that threshold. And I've been thinking that the market price on a premium bond in some sense does reflect all the contingencies uh, that, that could come up with that bond, uh, including that the bond gets refunded or, or currently refunded, it runs, may run to maturity, might even default. And the price really should reflect all those contingencies, even if the pricing rules kind of make it look like, like they don't. Um, and al although the concept of maturity is, is muddled by call of premium bonds, that's not, that, not something that's totally alien to the market. So, you know, mortgages, for example, you have 30 year mortgages, but in the mortgage market, it's understood the mortgages aren't generally going to run to 30 years. Uh, people run, uh, people sell their homes and refinance, and maybe the expected life is, is more like seven years. So that's something that can be dealt with if it's, if it's understood. But my observations on this is I would be inclined to secure fully committed funding for the life of a bond issue if I were an issuer as much as possible. I would rather do the equivalent of par bonds or, or do high call prices and, and make it a kind of equivalent to, uh, to, to par bonds. We're really locked in funding for the life of the issuer at a market rate. But if a fully informed issuer with their eyes open decides that they wanna set up more of a worst case scenario that they, they think they can improve on, then that, that could be reasonable. But they should consider, as Andy says, the whole lifespan of the issue. They should make a plan for managing the bonds just as our strategic farmer plans for the whole growing, growing season. They should not be surprised by adversities such as shifts in interest rates or regulations as we saw with advanced refundings or their own circumstances. And maybe it's even possible that they will be stuck with those high coupon bonds if rates go up high enough. But they should be anticipating the costs of future refundings if that's really part of their plan. But there's a challenge for municipalities because maybe one finance manager acts like that wise farmer, but when they're gone, the, the next one just looks at the debt schedule, it sees that it's scheduled, and they think that any change from that is really savings. When really that was a worst case and not a, not a base case in a sense. It's like getting excited that your, your kid is cutting C's when they used to have, used to have F's. It's, it's not really what, what you're looking for. The next big question, and I see that I'm, I'm getting a little short on time, is should issuers use taxable advance refundings? And Andy has, has covered the cons. Um, we know that there's gonna be negative arbitrage, um, that, that the escrow is not gonna be able to earn um, what, what, those, what those bonds cost. Uh, they're not gonna be able to extract uh, the, the value of that option. Um, and at least theoretically, they're better off, they're likely to be better off waiting. And also the savings are, are, are really misleading when they're compared again against that worst case scenario. And they tend to get overhyped. Uh, so th there's a real problem with the savings calculation and presentation. Uh, however, if, if the rates on the original bonds um, or, or if interest rates are very low and there are rumors of inflation like there were last year, it may be really prudent to go ahead and refinance as ugly as it is and take away that risk of higher rates. I don't think any issuers who refinanced last year regret that. Uh, another point is that it, it can be hard to know, well, what is that option exactly worth? There's the question of what is the volatility? What's appropriate? Do you look at, do you look at history? Do you try to get uh, a market volatility from another market? Uh, you're gonna get different answers. And I will defend the savings number a little bit in that at least it's in reference to the actual debt service schedule. And that is, that is a number that, those are numbers that, that take on meaning. So I think that issuers should take the value of that option extremely seriously. And they should understand it as well as they can. And their, their advisors should help them understand that. And Andy's right that, that advisors need to work harder to understand and explain option value. Uh, issuers need to understand how costly taxable advanced refundings can be. They should not jump like that treasure hunter when they hear about some possible large savings. Just because the PowerPoints show up 
doesn't mean you, you necessarily should jump. I think issuers should act like the strategic farmer and think strategically. They should know that the savings were planted at the beginning of the bond issue. They should be harvested when they peak in value. In theory, it may be best to avoid taxable refunding completely. But in practice, issuers should not ignore their own circumstances, their own risk tolerance, where interest rates are, and the other uncertainties that they may be exposed to. So to conclude, or so to conclude, I, I would rather avoid callable premium bonds as much as possible. I'd rather not have to sell taxable advance refundings. I'd much prefer to be able to wait and sell tax exempt debt if I could. But in life, I would also rather not see appliances break down when in the old days they used to last forever. We have to deal with reality. But we can also seek to improve on reality. And I applaud Andy for his commitment to making those improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Wynn. We appreciate your insight. Andy, I'm going to give you two minutes. That's and plenty. I'm set an alarm okay. because there's people coming behind us. No, no, Pepe, there's plenty. A few comments about the premium bonds. So everybody needs to understand that institutional investors want to buy premium bonds. They don't want to buy power bonds. Let's start with that. The problem is not with the premium. The problem is the, is the power call. So one way to do it is to... Uh, increase the call prices as uh, been advocated and I support. The other one is just to issue longer term optionless bonds. What's wrong with optionless bonds? We don't see any bonds over 10 years, non-callable. That's one point. Second, uh, we refer to TIC and uh, the problem is again with TIC is that it doesn't look at options. An alternative to TIC is option adjusted tick. I published something about this in the bond buyer. People are not using it. Options must be taken into account. Uh, and finally, about the restoration of advanced refunding, just one comment. There was a lot of uh, lobbying to do it. And who's lobbying for it primarily, if you look at it? It's the infrastructure, the people who benefit from the advanced refunding, not the issuers. It's the American Bar Association is a huge advocate of advanced refunding. And I'll stop right there. Great, thank you. I know this is an issue that um, is critically important and both of you all are passionate about and we appreciate your bringing that passion to the discussion and to the conference. We will take a brief break and we will come back at, I'm in a different time zone, um, at 2.40 um, East Coast time. No, 1.50 East Coast time. 1.50. Okay. We will see you all back then. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Peppy. You did a great job as a moderator with not always cooperative speakers. <laughs> they just all worked very
Michelle, I just sent you a note. Do you want to? Do you want me to introduce you, or do you want to just jump right in at one fifty? Uh, you can introduce me if that's okay. okay. I'll that's do okay. that. Then. And, can, uh, and like you said, I, I can introduce the panel. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Oh, no problem. Good afternoon. I'm David Wessel, uh, director of the Hutchins Center at Brookings and one of the co-sponsors of the Municipal Finance Conference. I'm very pleased today that we have a terrific panel to talk about Puerto Rico's bankruptcy, lessons learned both for Puerto Rico and for the entire muni market. I'm going to turn the virtual podium over to Michelle Kasky from Bloomberg, our very capable moderator. She's been an excellent chronicler of Puerto Rico's travails, and she will introduce the panel and take it from there. So over to you. Hi, thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico's bankruptcy. We have Natalie Jeresco, who is the former executive director of Puerto Rico's Financial Oversight and Management Board. We also have Sergio Marswash. He is the policy director at the Center for a New Economy. And David Skeel, he is chairman of Puerto Rico's Financial Oversight and Management Board. He also teaches law at University of Pennsylvania's Law School. And then also we have, and finally, uh, John Cefalio. He is an analyst at uh, Credit Sites. He's a senior muni credit analyst at Credit Sites who's been uh, following Puerto Rico for quite some time. So we're happy to have everybody here. Um, we're, we're looking forward to this conversation. And I just wanted to start off by saying, just on background as, as many people know, um, Puerto Rico um, for years was suffering from um, economic contraction, economic decline, population loss. And during those years, um, through different administrations, 
um, the governments then um, were borrowing money to basically keep the government operating. And that could that could last only for so long. And um, during that time, they there was this municipal bond market that was very, very willing to continue to lend to Puerto Rico. Um, but again, that it, it, it got to a point where the market just wasn't going to continue to lend to Puerto Rico at rates that Puerto Rico could accept. And this all really came to a head. Um, and Puerto Rico, um, at the time of the bankruptcy filing, uh, Puerto Rico and its agencies owed about, uh, owed more than 70 billion of debt and also had a pension fund that was essentially pretty much empty. And, um, and Puerto Rico's, uh, the, the financial oversight board sought bankruptcy on Puerto Rico's behalf in May of 2017. So since then, about half the debt has been restructured. Um, there are more workouts to come, um, most notably Puerto Rico's Electric Power Authority. Um, but basically, we wanted to get into, um, I wanted to ask the panelists, you know, Puerto Rico restructured its general obligation debt in March. Um, that effectively ended its five-year bankruptcy for the, the central government. And um, so that restructured about $19 billion of debt and started funding its pension its pension fund. So I wanted to ask, and um, maybe if David Skeel wants to jump in or, or Natalie, um, sort of with Puerto Rico's bankruptcy, you know, what worked, what didn't work, and, and what are some of potentially the implications for uh, the rest of the muni market? Sort of what lessons can be learned as of now from Puerto Rico's bankruptcy? So I'd like to say in, in response to what worked, what didn't work, uh, <laughs> everything worked um, uh, in the end. I don't know that that would be exactly an accurate um, statement. It did take five years and there were uh, lots of ups and downs that were uh, exacerbated by the, uh, the hurricanes, the, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the, uh, the ousting of a governor um, and the, um, the pandemic. Um, so it did take a, a, a long time, but it it really did work um, overall, in, in my view. Uh, we ended up where our objective when we started was, our mantra was once and done, um, that we couldn't do this, that Puerto Rico can't do this multiple times. They have one crack at bankruptcy, they're not going to have another crack. So you can't just do a hope and a prayer where you restructure the debt a little bit and hope that on uh, five or 10 years, the economy is doing well enough to, to uh, carry this heavy burden. Uh, we believed it needed to be once and done. And mm -hmm. what that meant was uh, we were very, very careful about how much debt there would be going forward. There's a maximum of one point one five billion dollars in any given year which is less than eight percent of puerto rico's own revenues the revenues that come um, from puerto rico to make something that made sense for the creditors and was fair to them and consistent with the rule of law we also added a significant amount of of, of uh, cash um, and created a, a contingent value instrument, an instrument that if Puerto Rico's economy does well in the future years, we'll pay more to creditors. If it doesn't do um, well in future years, it will pay less to creditors. And we can maybe get into some of the details of this if, if folks want um, later on. But it was a very long process. It took longer than we would have liked. I would say that's the main um, downside, but the the restructuring we ended up with, I'm just I cannot overstate how happy I am with it. And as I see Natalie, I have to do a shout out to Natalie. Natalie was the point person um, throughout um, this process. Um, a, a really great result for everybody, in in my view. Clearly sustainable for Puerto Rico going forward. Clearly fair to the creditors. Um, the the general obligation bondholders in particular will end up doing pretty well in the end. So really, really a good result in my view. Yeah, Sergio, what you wanted to say something? Well, yeah, I mean, I generally agree with David, but I I will do my analysis of of Promesa a little bit different. 
I, I think the law um, as enacted by Congress uh, basically uh, concentrated on three different items. And, and he mentioned one of them, which was the debt, you know, debt relief and debt restructuring, which is very important. Um, and Title III did produce uh, a plan of adjustment uh, that provides significant debt relief to Puerto Rico. Um, remains a question how you measure that, but, but in general, I, I agree that it, it, it succeeded in, in getting something, some debt relief to Puerto Rico. Uh, the second part of PROMESA was, though, uh, on reforming the budget process. And there, I think progress has been a little bit slower uh, due to the fact that there has been a lot of, you know, give and take between uh, the board and, and the local government, which I think was foreseeable since the beginning. And I remember talking to people at Treasury saying this, this is not going to be that easy. You know, politicians are just not going to give up this power uh, to, uh, to allocate the budget, especially because Puerto Rico, in many ways, it's still pretty much a patron client society uh, organized around extracting rare, I mean, uh, rents from, from the government and the politicians are loath to, to give those powers. And then there, there was a third component, uh, a very small component, but that was uh, very important. And it was a big selling point for the Obama administration, which had to do with Title V and you know, you know, strategic projects to, to get the economy going. And for several reasons that, that didn't quite work out. So uh, I think in, in general though, when, when you analyze uh, PROMESA as a whole, not only the Title III component, you know, some things worked, some things have, work partially and we're still dealing with the budget process especially you know getting puerto rico uh to to implement the internal controls and and the budget visibility process that it needs to going forward and the economic growth and strategic process uh strategic projects part generally fell down by the wayside mostly due to the hurricane to be honest uh but uh, I just wanted to to give a little more context as to how I see uh, the entire PROMESA process go, uh, working. Yeah, I think you're right, Sergio. It's definitely the PROMESA's, what, what it did is, you know, giving Puerto Rico the ability to actually reduce its debt and fix the pension fund. Um, that, that seems, I mean, that has really moved things along and helped mm -hmm. Puerto Rico to, uh, to get on a new path, but it, it does remain to be seen whether the local government will um, live within its means. Um, and and Natalie, Natalie's got something to say here. Mm -hmm. I just think that you really can't take the pieces apart that way. Mm -hmm. I think that the debt restructuring and the reduction of the debt payable and the resolution of the pension problems mm -hmm. The adoption of the plan of adjustment on the basis of a fiscal plan, which provides for a vision of how to see forward through this, is the baseline for being able to manage a balanced budget because we've reduced the stress on that budget so dramatically that now other choices get to be made. Mm -hmm. And it provides the baseline for economic development because you theoretically have a government that's more credible in the marketplace. You have a market with a resolved debt structure that should reduce capital costs across the board. Now, there are many other things that you know, governments need to do to be uh, attractive to, for, to, 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 to investment. There are many other things that governments need to do in order to resolve all the social problems that unfortunately remain in many societies. But without the debt restructuring, none of those things are possible. And so it's kind of a chicken and egg in some way, but I think the debt restructuring is the baseline. Now, now you need political will on the part of the elected leadership to do what elected leaders need to do and what their, what their constituents uh, drive. But I think that PROMESA was never supposed to be, was not seen as a control board, and we didn't play that role as a control board. As an oversight board, I think we accomplished a great deal. And I think we put Puerto Rico on a path where if it's elected leadership and the constituents demand that of their elected leadership can accomplish both, again, resolving social ills uh, with the government spending, as well as attracting and develop and economic development, attracting investment and economic development. I don't, I don't think that, you know, pieces failed. I think that they were never meant to be, uh, it was never meant to be a control board, which would have had the ability to enforce. 
in that in the way that Washington DC, for example, did. That's that's true, but I think then part of the problem then is um, down the road how what is going to what is going to force the local government to um, live within its means and and to implement these these structural reforms? I mean, at some point it will it it will um, fall back onto them, and I, I think that's that's the uncertainty going forward. Um, As it is in any municipal environment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at Detroit, you know, you have to have a government that serves the interests of its constituents. If you look at cities that are undergoing financial challenges or, you know, whether it's Chicago or the state of Illinois, you know, it, it's the same demands being made of elected leadership everywhere. Are mm -hmm. you serving the people? Are you using your resources wisely to reduce social ills and to attract investment and grow your economy? You know, why are we expecting that somehow the oversight board was supposed to be a magic solution for Puerto Rico? It, it, it provided the baseline for Puerto Rico, but, you know, elected leaders to need to take responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. I do think that going forward, though, and I, I know that the plan of adjustment uh, has some, you know, the limits and uh, other fiscal rules incorporated into it, but eventually the plan of adjustment will will end, right? I mean, it has some termination date. Uh, I do think there's a need to legislate new Puerto Rico safeguards uh, in terms of uh, fiscal rules, um, limits on deficit spending and, and debt issuance. We already have some of those even in, in our constitution and they obviously did not work or uh, or at least they were relatively easy to work around, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and we do have to do that, that work going forward uh, in terms of uh, what are the, the modern fiscal rules that make sense for Puerto Rico, what kind of safeguards uh, can we have going forward? And we have been doing some thinking about that. There's a lot of work that, as Natalie know, that has been done on many other jurisdictions about this. And, and that's certainly uh, pending uh, on Puerto Rico's side uh, to work on that, perhaps even amending the constitution uh, to, to have some, some real fiscal rules that, that make sense. And even, even the 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 fiscal plans they do warn that puerto rico will face future budget deficits if certain structural reforms aren't put into place um and and part of that has to do with that <clears throat> even with the debt restructuring um some of these fixed costs like uh, future debt service which as as david skeel pointed out has dropped dramatically but if you if you add that along with the, the pension payments that Puerto Rico needs to make every year, it's still taking up a, a, a sizable amount of the yearly budget. And that, that's the reality. Um, but again, it's it about future balanced budgets will really depend on the, some of these structural reforms. Again, you know, future balanced budgets require growth. Mm -hmm. And you need to grow the economy. You need to have a model of economic growth you can't do it all through the expenditure side. You can't, you can't balance budgets solely by reducing expenditures constantly, whether it's debt, pensions, or you know, other, other expenditures, education, police. It's just not, there's a limit to the, the reduction of expenditures. At some point, you have to see a model, and that's what those structural reforms are about. How do we get growth? How do we see a Puerto Rico that's competitive and attracting investment? To date, Puerto Rico's economic model has been based on federal funding, federal tax relief, and or Puerto Rico tax relief. Mm -hmm. How do you get out of that model and move to a model that's not based on offering tax reductions when you need those taxes to, 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 to invest in your social um, you know, policy? How do, you, how do you have a different economic growth model? And that's why those structural reforms focused on you know, the competitiveness of the you know, regulatory environment in Puerto Rico, permitting, uh, property registration, the, con the competitiveness of the labor market in Puerto Rico. How do we make it so that people believe that Puerto Rico is the best place to put their IT business? Um, mm -hmm. How do we build an, a cadre of workers that attracts uh, investors? So that's why those structural reforms are there, because over time, you've got to grow. And to grow, to grow you're going to need different policies in place than what are there today.
Uh, I agree with the, with the part that we need to grow the economy, but, but I think we have to go one step back, uh, Natalie. Uh, some of the policies that you mentioned may, may be very useful, but, but I don't think they constitute really a growth strategy. I mean, and that's the exercise that Puerto Rico needs to do. I mean, what's, what's, what, where are we, uh, where, where do we have a comparative advantage relative to, to the region, relative to, to the mainland? Um, where are the, the places where we should be making our bets in terms of uh, economic development, we really haven't done that analysis. Uh, I do know that Manolo Cidre and the people at the Department of Economic Development are have put out something out there. I'm not really convinced that what they, they have put out, it's really a strategy in the sense where you can actually uh, identify uh, sectors where Puerto Rico has a comparative advantage and, and you know, focus on those, on those sectors and then measure you know, whether or not they're delivering in terms of income, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, generating economic activity. Uh, and then, you know, reassess whether or not the whole plan uh, is working. There are many examples around the world, not only uh, in Europe, uh, also in the Caribbean, mainland. Uh, a lot of jurisdictions have done this. Uh, we in Puerto Rico did it uh, back in the 1950s when we were we had less resources available. So it's not impossible. Uh, but but I think uh, that's the step that, that we're truly missing right now uh, in terms of like doing that uh, economic strategy and does your policy choose your name uh, for the island. And I, I don't disagree with Sergio at all. I would just uh, say that those sorts of things, in my view, are not the primary responsibility of the board. Our, our most important <laughs> responsibility, and, and you're, I'm, you're not saying otherwise. Um, yeah. I just want to, to clarify that for, uh, for folks who might not instantly pick up on that. Um, our, our primary role, in my view, in this area is to create the conditions for growth, to, to make sure the balance or bu budgets are balanced, try to put in place a framework that will make that true, not just now, but but for a while to come. And, and we have created a runway that's gonna be very helpful in that regard. So we have in the plan of adjustment limits on the issuing uh, mm -hmm. issuance of debt for the next few years. Sergio alluded to those as well. We also require that massive amounts of money be put aside to make sure that we can make those pension payments that Michelle alluded to, that uh, $175 million a year minimum, up to 25% of, of the surplus, or I think it may even be 50% of the surplus, um, which is likely to, to end up being about $10 billion set aside to make sure that even if things do turn down in the future, those pensions will, will be paid. So there is a runway that has been created and the board does have some role in, in development. There are, there are some things we can do. Um, uh, title um, five is, is a piece of that. There's some other things we can do, but, but really that's Puerto Rico and, and its lawmakers will be putting the plans in place. Yeah, and um, definitely there's the question too of what's what's forward for Puerto Rico uh, once this, uh, all this federal money um, dries up. Uh, there's been a lot of FEMA money that's come to the island and uh, there's the COVID relief money. And John, I know you and I, we, we've talked about this, is the issue of what, what happens after all that federal money um, runs out. Yeah, I think, yeah. Michelle, thank you. Um, I, I think that's a cause for a lot of skepticism in the muni market, just as you look back in, in Puerto Rican history, um, it seems that at times when Puerto Rico, it seems that when Puerto Rico was prospering and growing, it was often because of investments from, from Washington, be they uh, military investments down there that, that helped the economy or uh, tax breaks down there that helped. And now um, money from the hurricane relief and, and rebuilding and also stimulus. Um, and if you look at the underlying Puerto Rico economy and, and the 
the foundations of it, 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 it seems very weak without that. And I think I'd, I'd particularly call attention to the demographics in Puerto Rico. And, and Puerto Rico lost um, almost 13% of its population during the last decade, which is just a staggering number. And, and you almost, you really can't find any jurisdiction in the world that hasn't had a war or a famine or something that lost anywhere near that amount. I mean, people made a big deal um, in the 2020 census when Illinois lost population and they lost less than 1% of, of population. So uh, Puerto Rico's loss is staggering. And when you look at the young por uh, population in, um, in Puerto Rico, um, that Puerto Rico now or 2020 census had half of the population of 14 and under that it did in 2000. So that's the, that's the labor force for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that, that's that small. And um, so who's going to be on the island? Who's going to work? Where's the labor force coming from that's going to attract employers? So I think there's a lot of concern that as the stimulus wears off, which had an outsized importance in Puerto Rico, and as the uh, hurricane rebuilding and, and reconstruction um, wears down, what's left in the economy. And so that's really up to up to Puerto Rico is if they can take that money and build a better infrastructure with it and a better water and sewer system, better highway system, better power system, um, then that could help build a foundation for future growth. But if, if that money is, is squandered or not used efficiently, um, not used to, for future growth, then um, we have real concerns 10 years out about, about Puerto Rico servicing its debt because of the economy. And what are some of the the industries that um, that Puerto Rico could look towards um, to really help grow the economy? I know um, tourism, the governments, the different administrations, they always talk about growing the, the tourism business. I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that even today, tourism is, is still less than 10% of, um, of Puerto Rico's overall economy. I was like shocked to hear that a number of years ago because everyone thinks it's like just the main thing that's driving the island. But, um, but John and Sergio, what, what are just some of the, the options that Puerto Rico has? Well, we, we, we still have a significant footprint uh, in pharma and, uh, you know, biotech, which, you know, has, has you know, decreased uh, over the years. But what we, we do have uh, a certain infrastructure there that we can leverage. Also, there, there are several opportunities that I think we're not taking uh, into account. You know, everything from like, you know, certain agricultural products so where you know they're high value added uh low volume you know like herbs and spices uh to uh things like um healthcare and by healthcare i mean um, um you know doing uh, r d on specific illnesses for example that affect hispanic populations you know we we may have uh, an advantage there uh we also have some great opportunities in Green energy, you know, uh, Secretary uh, Yellen is is talking about uh, onshoring or uh, French shoring. I, I guess is the word she's using. Uh, some of the stuff we buy from China now. Again, there are opportunities there. Uh, the big difference now, uh, uh, when relative to the 1950s, is that in the 1950s we were basically the only player in the region. We're not the only player in the region anymore, right? We have competition from Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, other countries that have signed, uh, you know, bilateral Lateral trade agreements with the United States. Uh, so we we really have to uh, you know put uh, put a lot of work into this and a lot of thought into how we can do it. But but the opportunities are there, in my opinion. I think it's. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say I think it's. I generally agree with Sergio. It's a little bit of everything. A little bit of agriculture. A little bit of tourism. A little bit of high tech manufacturing. And and but I, a lot of the manufacturing is always required federal tax incentives, which is, is worrisome. And then the other worrisome thing about manufacturing and having too many eggs in that basket is as time goes by, manufacturing tends to get more and more efficient and you need fewer and fewer employees to do the same thing. So it's not always, you know, the best thing for a local economy. I grew up in, um, in Northwest Indiana, and there used to be steel mills that employed 50,000 people, and they still make steel there. They make a lot of steel there, but now it's, you know, 100 people with master's degrees that are, that are doing it. And so those towns that used to have all those working class employees that were paying taxes and, and, and living in the homes there and going to school 
aren't really there in the in the same way. And so that's a tough thing about having a lot of eggs in the manufacturing basket. You know, I, I, and I, I agree with that completely. That's why I advocate more of a portfolio approach. I, I think traditionally, uh, you're right, traditionally Puerto Rico has done that. You know, we have put too much weight uh, on that sector. Uh, but I wouldn't disregard it completely, though, going forward. We do still have some some opportunities there. That's, that's all I'm saying. I agree. I'd like to get back to um, the bankruptcy itself again, and sort of get in some of the into some of those details. And definitely, one thing that that I was struck by um, with Puerto Rico's bankruptcy is it seems like it's starting or not starting, but it's continuing this trend of uh, pensioners um, faring better through the process than than bondholders and and other creditors. And um, so in Puerto Rico, there were uh, no cuts to to pensions, um, to pension payments, and the bankruptcy itself actually, as we said before, uh, ensured that uh, Puerto Rico would once again start um, investing in its pension fund um, so it can support its retirees. A similar thing happened in in Detroit. Uh, If I remember correctly in Detroit, pensioners actually took little bit of a haircut, but it was um, might have been around 10 percent or just less than 10 percent, which was uh, a lot less than than the haircuts that the bondholders took. So it seems like it's um, continuing this trend where the, the retirees, the public workers uh, are going to uh, do better than than the bondholders. And I'm wondering what you guys think about that. Um, do you see that continuing in the muni market? I'm going yes. to speak and say that I, I think this, that Puerto Rico is somewhat unique. And I think comparing it to Detroit and others may disagree and to other munis is, is not necessarily a fair comparison. A couple things. One, prior to the bankruptcy, not in the plan of adjustment, Puerto Rican public pensioners took a variety of cuts um, over the periods of the lead up to the crisis. And so if you only measure it as what's in the plan, you're correct. There were no cuts in the plan. However, there were a series of cuts prior to that. Mm-hmm. Second, I would argue that if you look at the average pensions of public pensions in Puerto Rico, they are substantially lower than in many other municipalities in the United States. And so we were we were faced with a with a challenge in Puerto Rico that if you were to cut uh, too deeply or cut uh, in any in any major fashion the public pensions, you would find yourself with a new social set of expenditures, which would reduce reduce your ability to sustain debt going forward anyway. Because these people had literally, in many cases, let's just take teachers, for example, no alternative. They had no social security. So this was their singular um, uh, source of uh, income when they retire. I think the other thing that it needs to be taken into account is that we didn't leave Puerto Rico with the same pension system. So there are no defined benefit systems left in the Puerto Rico public pensions. All of them have been frozen. All new employees are enrolled in what we would call, you know, a defined contribution or 401k, something like that. So the government is not incurring new expanding um, liabilities on the behalf of new public employees going forward. And I don't think there's a municipality that I'm aware of that is has that benefit that 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 that, that was created. Uh, financially for Puerto Rico in this process. So I think, you know, if you were to ask a pensioner that freeze and that fact that no one, no one is earning a defined benefit going forward is a major um, cost to these pensioners that doesn't appear in the numbers. But in fact, if you're attracting cops, just as as an example, one of the reasons the oversight board had to come up with something incremental in the defined contribution side for police is because you're competing with every jurisdiction in the United States for these cops. Bilingual police you know, are, are much in need throughout the country. And there isn't a single police force that I'm aware of that doesn't offer a defined benefit plan. So you know, public pensioners had, had problems previously, uh, or excuse me, had reductions. I think we need to take that into account. And I think that, you know, we take the second point, the, the, the average pensions were quite low mm-hmm. in, the, in the teachers, the judge, the, the teachers and the, um, and, the, and, the, and the general public um, pension fund. And I think third, um, not having a defined benefit plan going forward is a very meaningful thing that, that was, was given up, um, which fiscally is much better for Puerto Rico going forward, but is, makes it very different than other munis are gonna be considering. No, that's true. Um, 
that's a good point. And that was, uh, that, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, for Puerto Rico, it was a much more complicated situation in terms of how do we deal with the, uh, the retirement system and fixing that than in, in some other places. And, um, but it's, um, it, it, it makes a big difference for the island's finances and the people on the island that once again, there will be a pension fund, it will be growing every year. And um, I also wanted to get back into the, we talked about it, um, uh, David Skill mentioned it very briefly, the, the CVI, the Contingent Value Instrument, and how that, um, that was part of the compensation for, for bondholders. Um, and what this is, is it's, it's a very new type of instrument for the municipal bond market. And uh, basically, if, if Puerto Rico's sales, annual sales tax collections come in uh, greater than expected, better than expected, then, um, then that's how bondholders receive payment that year on the CBI. Um, so David or Natalie, if you just want to talk about this instrument, like how, how did it come? To, I, I think in the past, you guys have told me that it was, um, you know, the, the people at City, your financial advisor, uh, maybe brought this up and, but, you know, tell me really how it, it all came to be. Well, I'll, I'll say a few words and then maybe um, Natalie can, can fix my mistakes <laughs> and clarify and, and add things. Um, the idea of a CVI was out there almost from the beginning. So it, it was floating around the question, would there be a CVI, would there not be um, a CVI? I, I think City did come up with the ultimate idea. I may be misremembering that, but that's, that's my recollection. Um, the obvious benefit of a CVI is it's a way to, to agree to disagree. Uh, the creditors thought Puerto Rico was going to go gangbusters in the next 20 or 30 years. We were more concerned about where things were headed. There was a very big difference of opinion on likely future revenues, and a CBI is a way to, to bridge, um, bridge that gap. There are real downsides, there are real risks with CBIs as well, however. If you, if you uh, um, connect a CBI to a number that's either um, undependable, it doesn't really track the economy well, or it's manipulable. Um, it can be gained. The CBI can be can be a big mess. Um, and in the past, in the sovereign space, uh, CBIs have often been linked to GNP, and they have sometimes miss uh, misfired. So we were very mm -hmm. concerned about that. Did not agree to one until very late in the process. As you mentioned, the one we agreed to is, is connected to sales tax revenues. And in our view, it was it's a really, really elegant CVI. It's very attractive because it's only a portion of Puerto Rico's revenues. The maximum it can, um, it can end up being is less than 8% of Puerto Rico's revenues. It's also a stream of revenues that's very difficult to game. Uh, sales tax revenues as revenues go are pretty precisely determined. It's hard, it's pretty hard to, to uh, play games with them. They also track the economy really well. Um, and so we ended up with the CBI that I, I think it's, um, I think it's a wonderful CBI. Maybe we'll come back in 10 years and it will misfire and we'll say, what in the world were we doing? But um, I really think it is, it's an elegant CBI that um, I think people ought to look at in other public entity bankruptcy or restructuring kinds of situations. Yeah, John, do you anticipate that this CBI structure could be used in other muni workouts potentially? Yeah, I, I I think so. I think I, I think it's a good idea, and it does make sense and align the uh, the creditors and the um, and the debtor together. Yes, absolutely. And and so far, you know, it's only been a few months, but what has been the the market's reaction to to the CBI? I think it's generally been pretty favorable. I think that you know, there's been outflows market market wide, so it's been a it's been a challenging time mm -hmm. for I guess all the entire market but all the all the puerto rico bonds over the over the last few months mm -hmm. and john did you have something to say about pensions was there a comment that you want to make about oh puerto i will just 
well, just quickly, because I, I totally agree with everything Natalie said, but she's right to bring out the fact that all these reforms had already been made and, and the reforms going forward and that the, the pensions were modest um, to begin with. But I, I do think your original question about is this going to happen in the rest of the market? And I think, yeah, I think that th there is a precedent that was set in, in Detroit and in some of the California bankruptcies. You know, that's never been litigated all the way up. So I, I don't know, it might not be the case. But I think when you think about it, when you're in negotiations, it's just um, um, the pensioners, I think, have a, a better moral claim and a better political claim, you know, a retired bus driver, retired teacher or something than, than do, uh, does a mutual fund, for example, who might be hesitant to get into a public fight uh, with pensioners. So I, I, I do think that that's, that's largely a, a precedent and it'll continue to go that way. Mm -hmm. I also think this this is a, an interesting policy issue that that will arise, you know, in other states. You know, um, in general, uh, human beings are not very good at making intertemporal uh, decisions, you know, between different time frames. And uh, this this raises the question, you know, which group is very positioned to to assess and assume this risk: bondholders or pensioners? Uh, and in general, you would say bondholders would have. A, or their financial advisors uh, would be in a better position to to assess and assume this risk than your average you know government worker. So and generally you want to allocate risk to those who, who are uh, the better uh, position to bear them over the long run. So uh, so I think this precedent uh, uh, make I mean this decision will keep keep coming up. I mean Illinois has problems and other states have problems with uh, with pensions. It's not only Puerto Rico and. And, and this is just going to keep arising, you know, uh, who, which group is, is really best positioned to actually assume this risk. Mm -hmm. And um, I want uh, to get into PREPA, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. That's, uh, that's really the main entity that's sort of next in terms of th that needs to be uh, restructured. There's about 9 billion, roughly about 9 billion of debt uh, that needs to be worked out. And uh, PREPA is the main supplier of electricity on the island, and um, it has its struggles. There's, and I hear from many people who live there, Sergio, you can uh, uh, tell us about this, but, th but that, um, that outages are, are very common. Um, the electricity is not cheap. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of frustration on the island with, with, uh, with the electricity. So um, D David, if, if you could, you know, kind of get us up to speed on sort of what's the next step with in PREPA's bankruptcy and where is it at? Um, that's precisely the thing I can say the least about, but I can, <laughs> I can because we're in mediation right now, I can, um, I can uh, put the framework in, in place though. And if, other, if others want to make comments, they can make comments. Um, so uh, PREPA was a, was a, a disaster even before PROMESA was enacted. When people talked about uh, Puerto Rico's financial crisis back in uh, 2014, 2015, they usually had PREPA in particular in mind. Uh, PREPA had blackouts back then. Um, I remember on the eve of our first public meeting back in 2016, there was a blackout. Um, uh, so so uh, PREPA was a mess even before PROMESA. It got even worse after Hurricane um, Maria. So it is, it, it is essential to Puerto Rico's future. It has been the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems in many respects. Um, the, the two things that I would mention are the two pieces of the transformation of PREPA. Um, one is the debt restructure, and I'll get to that in a second, which is what you asked about in particular. The other is um, transforming PREPA so that these problems of the past um, will be problems of the past and not problems of the, of the future. Uh, the uh, governors of Puerto Rico with the Oversight Board support have brought in a private operator to run Puerto Rico's transmission and distribution. PREPA is still publicly owned, but there's now a private operator called Luma for the, the uh, distribution and transmission. Um, their coming in over the last year or so has been, um, 
has not been a magic wand that has caused all the problems to go away, but the trajectory is good. And I think uh, they will they will end up being an important part of the transformation of PREPA. There is a request for proposals process that is well, well underway for to bring in a private operator for the, the old generation assets, the legacy uh, uh, generation as well. So a big part of PREPA's future is getting this in place, transforming it to make it a reliable um, source of electricity. Um, the other part of it is the restructuring. Um, there was a restructuring uh, uh, that was partially negotiated before PROMESA, um, it was renegotiated uh, in the uh, several years after PROMESA. We ended up with an agreement in principle, uh, which is called a, was called a um, restructuring support agreement with uh, most of the bondholders who are 90% of the debt of PREPA. Um, that was tentatively reached in 2018. It was finalized in 2019. Um, but then we had the pandemic and also some resistance from the legislature to passing the legislature, legislation that that agreement needed. Um, it kind of, it was in place. Um, uh, one of our advisors described it as having been on life support for a while. <laughs> um, earlier this year, the governor terminated it. We agreed with the governor's termination of the agreement because the economics no, no longer made sense after, um, after everything that had happened with, um, with the pandemic. Um, we are in negotiations with the bondholders and with the other creditors. That is in mediation. It has been in mediation for, um, for a number of weeks now. We have a deadline of August 1st to either put a plan on, on the table, um, a proposed a plan of adjustment, or put a term sheet on the table, or um, put in place or, or suggest a schedule for litigation. There are, there are several key issues that, um, that, are potential, that are the subject of litigation and that litigation at this point is, is all on hold. So where we are is we're in the middle of the, the restructuring. Uh, it's in mediation, so I can't say uh, really much of anything about the details. Do you think it's, I just want to add two things, Michelle, one pre yeah. and one um, post. Pre, just so everyone understands that the FEMA monies to, to rebuild the damaged electric system uh, only started to have, uh, PREPA only started to access them mm -hmm. this year. So four and a half years afterwards. So when we talk about LUMA and we talk about short, you know, LUMA is operating a system that was incredibly damaged and has only now, literally, I think January, was the first access to the FEMA monies to, re to rebuild, restore the system. And so, you know, that, that is really critical. There's a substantial amount of federal funding going to rebuild the system, much of it, the great bulk of it, into transmission, and it's only just begun. So contracts were only starting to be let in January, February this year. That, that's all ahead of us. And then the second part that I'll just mention in terms of the future is that just as important as that P3 that is in process for the legacy generation is uh, the government and the board working carefully together on a wide variety of RFPs for uh, renewables. And I'm, I've been gone off the island for a month, so I can't say exactly, but I know where we were, which is, you know, we had done a thousand megawatts already and we were in the process of doing the next big um, piece of renewables such that you could slowly decommission the legacy assets over time and move to cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable generation on, on, on the side of renewables. So two, two more pieces of this prep a picture to take into account. That's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, go, going hand in, in, in just like how the, the economy uh, is benefits when it's diversified for prep as well uh, to d diversify how it creates the energy is, is super important as well. And, um, you know, David, what would, not to be negative, but what would, it, if PREPA were to leave um, Title III and need to be litigated, uh, what would that look like? What, what court would that be in? Um, what, what would that process be like? 
it, it would be in the Title III court. Um, it would stay in Title III court? Okay. It would stay in the Title III okay. court. Uh, so Judge Swain would, would be overseeing it. As I said, there, there are a number of different issues. One of the big, one, uh, big ones is whether the bondholders have a valid lien, and if they have a valid lien, a lien on what? Um, how much do they have a lien on? Our view is if they have a valid lien, the only lien they have is a lien on amounts that have, have already been uh, transferred into a trust. Um, and that's a, it's a, a very small amount. So, um, so there, there's litigation along those lines um, that, uh, and there's some other issues around that as well. The creditors committee has, has um, some litigation that it would like to pursue as well. Now, hopefully that won't be necessary, but, um, but it is out there. But doesn't, don't bondholders have a lien on PREPA's ability to generate revenues? Uh, our view is no, that they have, they only have a lien on um, the uh, payments made by customers once those are put into an account um, for the benefit of bondholders. And until they're put into that account, the, the, the lien does not, does not cover them. So, so I have a question for David. Uh, so it, it appears to me that from your answer, um, you you seem to be ruling out the 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 you know the potential of actually dismissing the Title III case. That's not one of the options we were given. <laughs> we don't have well, so that they, is you know that is uh, they, that is another possibility. Oh, you know, it is the, the judge did say that one of the options was for the board to submit a memo as to why to, to show costs as to right, why true. It, that's it, true. It that's true. So, that's uh, true. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody thinks that would be a good outcome, but it you're right, it is it is in the memo. Um the as of now, I mean, do you, do you and do you see things leaning more towards that August first uh, due date being extended because there have been extensions in the past, or are, are things progressing that something could could be filed? That's precisely the sort of thing that I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to try. I'm to try. <laughs> like the good reporter that you are, uh, yeah. as, uh, as I learned very early on in this case, be careful what you say to Michelle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody's been telling me this for years. Um, you can't fix Puerto Rico's economy. You can't, the economy really can't grow unless you fix PREPA because the businesses need to know what their future costs are for electricity so they can forecast that um, to attract people to live on the island um, that needs to be fixed. Does we, anyone want to weigh in on that? We, we have been saying that since 2005 actually, yeah. you know, uh, having, uh, you know, reliable, uh, affordable energy affects all economic activity, you know, hospitals, hotels, uh, farm servers, server farms, everything. So uh, unless retail, so so unless that's that's taken care of, I mean, it's uh, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh, future growth. The the other risk going forward, in addition to to prepa, I, I'm going back to something that Natalie said, uh, is in my view is the. Puerto Rico political class. Uh, I mean, they they seem to have learned nothing since uh, 2015, and and that worries me. You know, uh, things that I have seen recently, um, attempts to cover recurring uh, expenses with non-recurring revenues, raiding the state insurance fund uh, to lower electricity costs for three months. Those are the kind of things that got us into this mess into the first place, right? So, um, so going forward, uh, more than economic risk and more than uh, geopolitical risk, you know, what's happening in the world, uh, you know, endogenous to Puerto Rico is that our political class uh, is not getting its act together. Uh, and it's demonstrating to the world that they really, really have learned nothing and forgotten nothing since 2015. Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, there could be, I don't know, there could be maybe younger people on, on the island who start pursuing office and, and in local office. And I, 
You never know. I, I think there's on the mainland, sometimes I'm, I'm very, I feel very optimistic about some young, younger people who are becoming more politically active and involved. And uh, I would imagine that that's got to happen in, in Puerto Rico as well. I, I would hope so. I would hope so. But just recent actions that have been taken by, by the legislature and the executive, to be fair, uh, do not inspire a lot of trust, I think. No, it's it's true. It's a uh, it's it's a major shift that needs to be made that that we really haven't seen the full effects of yet. And we have roughly about five minutes left, or, or just a little under that. And I want to get into two things: this issue of um, um, the idea that I mean, at some point, Puerto Rico uh, will probably get credit ratings again, and beyond after that, maybe even possibly investment grade credit ratings. And I also want to talk about the future of the board. So, um, John, I wanted to ask you, you know, what what do you think it's going to take for Puerto Rico? Because uh, as of now, the the new GOs, the restructured GOs, uh, the COFINAs as well, the restructured sales tax bonds, they don't have credit ratings yet. What is it <coughs> going to take for them to get ratings? And then even after that investment grade? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Well, the ratings are important. Um, a lot of a lot of firms have bought the Puerto Rico bonds, but once they get a rating, more people can buy the bonds. There'll be a bigger market for the bonds. A lot of funds are not allowed to buy or have limited on the amount of unrated bonds they can hold. So getting a rating is, is a big deal and, and should change the pricing of the bonds. I think a key thing would be getting audited financials. I don't work at a rating agency, so I can't say exactly what they need here, but I do believe at the Puerto Rico Investor Conference, I heard um, promised later this summer that the FY19 and 20 uh, audited financial statements would be out. So if that's the case, that would be a big help. I don't know if that's enough to, to get the rating, but I think that would be a big step. Um, I think getting PREPA solved, even though it's not directly related to the GO just uh, would reduce the uh, uncertainty. And so that might help make the case to the rating agencies. Um, I, I think that um, right now, I mean, I would wager, like if I just had to guess where the rating would be, I would probably say that at the major rating agencies, the GO would probably be a high B category around there. And then maybe Cofina and, and Prasa, which which never defaulted on its muni debt, maybe could be a notch higher than that. Um, and then I think possibly the rating, you know, if the performance is good, the governance is good, could rise a, maybe a notch a year after that would be a kind of aggressive. So you can, you know, would be a few years to get to investment grade. I think the rating agencies, I think they'll have the same concern that investors do is what happens when the board goes away and, and what's the willingness to pay like and it, the discipline of uh, the local politicians, which is what we've been talking about earlier, once the board has left. And some of the rhetoric down there has, has maybe not inspired confidence. Um, so I think the rating agencies would be thinking about that too, is, is what's this rating like when the board is not there uh, watching over the, the finances? Yeah, that's true. and. Um... The, there's also the question of how much uh, how much longer the board is going to be there. Um, under PROMESA, it, there needs to be um, a, a number of years of, of consecutive balanced budgets, and there needs to be market access. And um, but, John, do you have sort of a, an estimate of how long you think the board will remain? The oversight. I mean, board? I think that the way that Congress wrote PROMESA is pretty frustrating when you read it. It's adequate access to short-term and long-term credit markets at reasonable interest rates. And so what does adequate mean? What is reasonable interest rates? Um, seems like the rates the bonds trade now is pretty reasonable. Um, I would think getting a rating would, would be good to proving that adequate market access and then maybe selling a small bond issue with that rating. That would help in the, the four years of balanced budgeting. I'm a little unclear. Do you have to have modified accrual balanced budgets? Do you need to have audits to prove that? I, I have a lot of questions about how that works and would be interested to hear David or Natalie weigh in too. I'll give my unofficial perspective and then David can speak officially. I have a little more freedom than David does. <laughs> Got it. So the law is really written such that the board gets to make the determination. There are some cardinal aspects of the determination written into the law, but there is enormous flexibility on the part of the board uh, beyond what's in the law. So it, the board has to recognize four consecutive years <clears throat> of balanced budgets on a modified accrual accounting basis for mm -hmm. all covered instrumentalities. 
all covered in history drawings. Now, can the board say it can only it will only look at this covered instrumentality or this one or that one or they all of them? That's up to a, a board to make a determination. At least while I was there, my view was this: let's try and get four ballots. <laughs> let's let's try and get one, two, three, and then four before we worry about whether or not it's only the Commonwealth or the Commonwealth and Prepa or the Commonwealth Prepa Prasa and all the other covered instrumentalities. Remember that all the municipalities are also covered instrumentalities. And I, you know, and it's up to the board to make the determination when, when it's time. And the board shouldn't, in my view, have to make that determination too early because we're not even there yet with the most basic entity, which is the Commonwealth. And in my view, yes, you would need an audited financial statement in order to use it as a comparison to the self-reported results to be able to say, yes, I, the board, designate this as a year of balanced budget based on an audit. Now, the audit won't be necessarily based on modified accrual accounting, so you're going to have to do a mapping between the self-reported and the audit, and all of that is a process. But to get there, and this is why the focus has been on the audits, which you mentioned, John, you got to get caught up on the audits. So mm -hmm. if my understanding is we should be caught, or Puerto Rico should be caught up, I'm still saying we, there you go. Puerto Rico should be caught up um, sometime, you know, next year. Uh, by the end of next year, it, it theoretically could have the fiscal year, um, you know, in, in place uh, audited. Then you could look back to 21 and say 21 was or was not the first balanced year for the Commonwealth. Uh, and that's leaving aside all of the judgment involved in the second piece that you mentioned, which is adequate market access at reasonable rates. That's just the first piece, right? Let's just try and get the first piece was my view. Um, and we're not, we're not even at one year technically because we don't yet have an audited year for the balanced year. And a balanced year would require post debt restructuring so that your debt service was actually in there when you made the determination. Mm -hmm. So you know that, that's where I think, I think the board has, the law gives the board enormous space to make the determination above and beyond what's in, you know, written in the text of the law. Mm -hmm. David, was there anything you wanted to add about uh about the board and, and how much longer the, the board would be um, working on Puerto Rico's finances? No, I was really glad that Natalie did all the talking. <laughs> uh, the, all I'll say is um, just to kind of underscore, I, I share Natalie's view that we need audited financial uh, mm -hmm. audited financials. And so we will not officially have a, the first balanced budget until we have those audited financials. I believe we're through 2019 um, at this um, at this point. Um, but and the the fiscal year 22, the one we just finished, could be the first balanced budget. Um, it has the potential to be, but we won't know until we have audited financials. That, that was fiscal 22? Fiscal 22. Yeah, the current um, year. Yeah, yeah, the key year. was restructuring the debt and, and Puerto Rico making payments on its debt obligations. Yeah. But this gets back to something Sergio mentioned earlier that everyone needs to take into account. I mean, there is a constitutional requirement for a balanced budget. And so we get to the question, you're like, why is that not happening? Well, because it appears that it's been kind of understood to mean when you adopt it, are the numbers balanced? My projection of revenue with it versus do I maintain an actual balanced budget during the course of the year? So you have a legislature that typically, you know, legislates and expenditures that are not budgeted during the year. They have to stop doing that as a practice, right? Mm -hmm. If you haven't budgeted an expenditure and you're adding it, you know, that's clearly going to put you out of balance during the course of the year. And that happens, you know, at least while I was there the last five years. Yeah. So that's how we got into this mess into the, into the first place, right? Because the concept of available resources is much broader than available revenues. And, and they included the issuance of new debt for deficit financing in order to, to bridge the gap. So that's one of the things that we definitely need to fix in the constitution. John, was there one thing that you were gonna, uh, you were gonna say? I was just really quickly gonna say Congress could change this at, at any time. It's true. Yeah, there, there is a bill currently in the U.S. Congress that would uh, allow the board to wrap up sooner than what PROMESA um, spells out. But um, from what we've been hearing so far is that there there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement of that bill. So, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I, I want to thank everyone for participating today. And I, I really enjoyed this. And it's great seeing you guys all together and, and discussing 
Puerto Rico. And um, thank you again so much for a wonderful panel. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thank Thanks, Brookings. Bye. Thank you, guys.